Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for attending. Um, we have uh, regrets from our CEO as he's off on vacation. So uh, Mr. Dunmore is the interim CEO for that period of time. And we have uh, Cheyenne Hancock taking the minutes today to assist Mr. Simpson. So at this time, I want to remind all of the members of the gallery where the emergency exits are and also that the uh, proceedings is, are being videotaped and we still are ongoing argument with YouTube. <laughs> Disclosure of pecuniary interest of uh, members of council can be made now or at any time throughout the meeting and they must be submitted in writing. Uh, if we require, we will have a break around 10.30 a.m. So at this time, I'd like to ask for approval of the agenda of session 20-2019 as circulated. Moved by Martin and seconded by Creelman. And is there any uh, additions, deletions? Seeing none then, all in favor? That carries. And approval of the previous minutes, that Council approves the minutes of session 19-2019 as circulated. Moved by Maitalo and seconded by Nix. Any discussion? All in favor? That carries. And so we are now at public's question period. Is there any questions of the gallery? Yes, Mr. Monroe. Bill Monroe, 13 Bayberry Road, Mono. Morning, Your Worship, Councillors. I have a question to ask about uh, budget item number four, the delivery and efficiency study. The letter in the, from the CEO told us that uh, the government gave us back some of our tax money as a grant of 500,000. It's uh, an efficiency study. To get to, to my point of it, it's the bottom. He's talking about an internal study, efficiency study. He's suggesting it is done internally as opposed to getting a consultant. I, I think this is a bad idea. For transparency's sake, at least, it should be done by a consultant. And while I grudge every penny they get for transparency's sake and to get a usually a very good report, I would suggest that you go to uh, an outside agency for that, Your Worship. Okay. And uh, Mr. Dunmore, did you want to comment on the rationale? The way that I had interpreted Mark's uh, report was that he may use the same uh, consultant that the county is using and or should he not be happy with that consultant, we would uh, look to another consultant. I think what he's trying to say is we want to do an internal efficiency study. Maybe it was misleading to the point that he said that we were going to do it by internal staff, but I think the, the goal, and Fred can correct me if I'm wrong, um, was to have a consultant perform this study. Okay. He says, I am proposing that a similar review be completed internally ideally followed following the county study so he's a no marks marks intention and we did discuss that by internal he means the town of mono vices the county of dufferin study as he says in it the intention is to consider piggybacking on the same consultant that the county's using so it isn't which going is to where be internal mentions. to mono right so he's referring to town of mono when he says internal yeah but who would do the study? Who physically would do the study? The, the intent is to consider using the same consultant that the county's using because it's in the RFP from the county that that consultant could be available for lower tiers within the county to use. Yeah, and you can also go to another consultant, you also. Well, sure. At this yeah. point, that's a recommendation. Okay. But it will be done by someone outside. Thank you, Your Worship. Thanks. Any other questions of the gallery? 
Seeing none then, uh, we do have a delegation at 9.15, so uh, we could uh, continue with unfinished business and deferred items, the fire mark a demonification technology program. Is that okay? Okay. And uh, so that uh, report is uh, provided to you in, in the agenda. Uh, so Mr. Nix, you have some comments? Well, <clears throat> when I initially read the staff recommendation, I wasn't sure I could agree with it because I we're leaving unclaimed insurance money on the table uh, until we sign that agreement. However, in discussion with Les and Mark before he left, uh, they did raise some good points that I couldn't. For example, let's say we do sign the agreement and Firemark now collects uh, insurance money from the whole area of Moore, some of that is going to go to the Orangeville Fire Department. Well, as Les and Mark a asked me, okay, uh, Orangeville Fire Department, they have a sort of a costing model. It's not uh, town specific. It's just that here are all the calls we do outside the town of Orangeville. Here are all the calls we do inside the Orangeville, blah, 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 blah. And here's how much the township should be paying us. That's how, that's how they arrived at. That's why our fees went up. Their, their charges to us went up 25%. Um, a couple of years ago, which was quite a stiff increase. So the question is, let's suppose we sign with Firebark, and now they start capturing some of that insurance money, and some of it's going to go to the Orangeville Fire Department. Would that be reflected in the fees they charge us? Well, I couldn't answer that. So I, I agreed after talking to Les and Mark that I don't mind holding off. And, and there's, there's other questions they raised too. But I don't want this uh, recommendation that we defer a decision on it to mean you know, a year from now, we're still okay. I, I think, yes, you raised some good questions. Let's see if we can get some answers to them in, in the next month or so and ha have this item back on uh, the future agenda. Okay. Mr. McNeil? Uh, I have three, uh, three thoughts about this. Uh, one is that the flow of money is not clear. Yeah. Um, in fact, uh, at our fire board meeting um, last night, uh, which uh, included Adge Toss, they were convinced that the money went direct back directly to the municipality. So, um, and I've talked to Les too, and he, he, he wants more clarification on the flow of the money. The uh, second point is that um, it's not clear where this would affect uh, homeowners' premiums. And I think we need to look into that. Uh, in, in the comments there, uh, they suggest that it wouldn't, and I didn't follow that rationale because your premiums are often affected by your previous claims. So that's another concern. And um, the, uh, the final one was um, whether or not there's a problem of us uh, doing a, a partial fire mark agreement, in other words, with one or two uh, uh, fire departments, and whether or not it makes a difference, whether the other members, such as Aftos and, and Lomer, uh, are in or, 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 or out. So there's a few questions I think that need to be answered before we move forward on. I recognize your uh, point that it's a good one that we're losing money the longer that we, we wait. Can I just ask one point? Mm -hmm. just, just on the insurance thing, well, and I am not an insurance expert, but my understanding is the, the fire bureau, or whatever it's called, or, or insurance, they come and they do a rating of an area, and they look at the fire departments there, they, they look at Shelburne District Fire Board, how many trucks, what's your time, blah, 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 and they, they give us a rating. So I don't know that if we start to collect some of that money for a fire call, which is, you know, in some insurance policies is only $500, that it's going to affect our, any of our residents' insurance premium, okay? What, what I am afraid of is that with the joint municipalities signing that agreement, and let's say all claims go up a little bit, we could see our insurance premiums go up and still not get any insurance money because we haven't signed that fire mark. I, I, I'm not claiming I'm an expert on that, Ralph, but that that's what my concern over the premiums issue would be. So I think, I think we need to look at this, uh, the, uh, the premium issue first. Okay. Yes? I was quite surprised to hear about all this money that was being <clears throat> left uh, sitting on the sidelines that uh, could otherwise go to uh, such things as uh, equipment for the fire boards. Um, I'm in favor of dealing with this uh, within a month and getting some answers, and in particular, whether or not uh, anything that we uh, 
sent to Orangeville, and I think Calvin will also apply, uh, is, uh, can be subject to a, a reduction in, uh, in, in their uh, annual billing to us. So uh, there, you know, we basically realize that money by uh, lower bills from those two departments. Okay, <coughs> so then uh, with, uh, sorry. It's all right, because strangely, I was going to agree with uh, Councillor Nix. So if we can uh, turn that back to staff for further investigation, if we can have a report back maybe uh, the end of November, if that's possible. Okay, so uh, we do have our delegation here and the, the items going forward are all to do with uh, capital projects for budget for 2020. So if council is in agreement and if the delegation is willing, if you'd like to come forward and you can start early. Delahunt. I'm the interim president and CEO at Headwaters Healthcare Centre and I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, Stacey Dobb, the previous president CEO, has uh, passed me the torch, so very honoured. I am joined today with our board chair, Lori Kerr, uh, and our chief of paramedics, veteran paramedics, uh, Tom Reed, and also our uh, communications director, Jennifer. So if there are any questions afterwards, uh, if I can't answer them, I will certainly defer to my esteemed colleagues. So just a little bit about our hospital uh, before I jump into giving you an overview of our new strategic plan and some priority areas and exciting developments at the hospital. Um, in a nutshell, there's a lot on this slide, but we are a very busy community hospital. We have, and this is uh, going on last year's uh, information and numbers, but we had over 28,000 outpatient visits. We had 24, over 24,000 inpatient admissions. We had over 600, close to 700 telehealth visits. Those are uh, electronic e-visits. Uh, we had over 4,000 orthopedic visits uh, and over 3,500 dialysis visits. And then I think probably a, a key note to highlight is our emergency department visits. Our hospital and our ED department was originally built for around 20,000 annual visits. We are now seeing well over 42,000 ED visits a year in our hospital. So there's lots of growth. Um, on the right hand side of the slide, you can see a lot of our inpatient activities. And then, you know, really to highlight our family at Headwaters, that's along the bottom. We have over 150 physicians now that work at Headwaters. We have over 700 staff members, uh, 45 medical students a year that come through our hospital, and more than 400 volunteers. So we're a great family, lots of activity, Lots of great service that we provide. Uh, just some points to note in our community, we are growing as you are very well aware. Um, you know, in the last five years, the population of Caledon as an example increased by 11.8%. Uh, during the same period, our region, Dufferin County, had a growth rate of 8.5%. And then Shelburne a couple years ago was cited as the second fastest growing uh, town in Canada. Uh, we are seeing also uh, some growing rates of poverty in our region. Uh, and as well, I'm sure you're very well aware, you know, our, our Lynn region, our local health integration network region and this area is underfunded actually in all areas of healthcare service delivery. So something that we do continually advocate for. Now, what I'm gonna spend the majority of time this morning speaking to you about is our new strategic plan that Headwaters Healthcare Center has launched in June of this year. And this plan really is about the community. And we spent a lot of time and effort last year uh, engaging the community, really going out to listen to people uh, in places where they were meeting to really get grassroots uh, input. We had over 3,000 people that were engaged as part of our process to develop our new strategic plan. Um, we had more than 1,500 surveys completed. And just to give you a comparison, uh, you've probably all heard of Sunnybrook Health Centre in Toronto, a very big 
uh, facility. Uh, when they did their most recent strategic plan, they had about 400 surveys come back from their community. Up here, we had over 1,500. So it just goes to show you the level of commitment and dedication that our community has to our healthcare center, which is great. Uh, we engaged a number of organizations. Uh, we had a number of primary care engagements. Uh, we did a number of delegations over the past year, uh, had many, many community events, and then did also a lot of engagement internally with our staff and our board and our volunteers. So lots of great input. We do also want to thank uh, the town for also spreading the word and giving us input as well. These, oh, I'll go back one. These are just some, <laughs> hold on one sec. These are, I want to show you. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. Hold on. I'm gonna go back one sec. Okay, once I figure this out, <laughs> I'll use the mouse. That's easier. I no no no. It's okay, Jen. I got it. I can do the yeah. The mouse is actually way easier. Okay, okay I'll project. Thank you though. Okay, these are just some pictures of some of the events that we held uh, out in the community at the farmers market, for example, is the the top left there, I believe, and then internally with community partners, with our paramedics. Uh, and also internally at our hospital. So this is a high level snapshot and overview of our strategic plan. And what we have decided and what we did at Headwaters is we moved away from the typical kind of mission uh, vision. We actually have now one purpose that we are working towards as a community with our partners. And that is really one community caring together. And down the left hand side, you can see our strategic priorities. The first one is around, and what we heard a lot about, is that the hospital does provide high quality care. Uh, a lot of community members told us that, but there is always still room for some improvement so we can get even better. The second strategic priority is nothing about you without you. And so we are really working hard to engage our patient and family advisors that we have in the hospital, including our staff in decision making and priority uh, prioritization. So really ensuring we have lots of engagement and then integrated care closer to home. So we are still striving and looking at our population need growth areas and what services can we continue to bring to Headwaters Healthcare Center that will, that will serve our community. And also how can we do that with our partners, with partnerships out in the community. On the right hand side, there are our values of kindness, passion, courage, and teamwork. Some key hospital updates, and they do align with our strategic priorities. You may have heard about Ontario health teams. So there is a lot of provincial change happening on the healthcare landscape right now currently. Um, the biggest one is that Ontario Health is a new agency that is being formed in Ontario with the 14 local health integration networks and six other agencies merging to form one big provincial body. And then locally, the province put out a call for applications for communities and partners, hospitals, primary care, home and community care to come together to develop an integrated health team. Uh, in, up in Headwaters, and we are calling ourselves the Hills of Headwaters Collaborative, uh, we did bring together partners, key partners, community members, patient and family advisors, and we did put in a submission uh, in the spring. There were 100, over 130 submissions put in provincially. 31 of those were invited to move on to the next stage and to submit a formal application. We were one of them. Uh, yeah. We held a big symposium to really garner our common purpose. And we did submit our full application actually on October 7th. They were due on October 9th. Uh, we submitted on the 7th and we actually just received a letter from the ministry last week that they will be coming out to do a site visit, which is the next step in the process to really evaluate, are we ready as a team? Are we becoming integrated? Are we ready to become designated an Ontario health team? So all very excited, very exciting work. Some other key hospital updates. There is a lot of growth and increased volumes happening at Headwaters, which is very exciting. Uh, we now are offering, um, increased cancer treatment services. We're starting to work towards people having their first appointment at Headwaters uh, instead of going to South Lake or Brampton initially. Uh, we now have on-site chemotherapy preparation, which allows medications to be prepared on site instead of having them brought in. Uh, that's more convenient for our patients and families. And also internally, it's more cost effective. 
We also have a new urology program and we have recruited a new urologist, Dr. Moodley, who began working at Headwater several months ago. And we're also working very hard to make some inroads and provide better palliative care to our community. And in fact, um, our primary care physicians have come together and committed to whether or not a palliative patient is rostered with them or attached to their practice, they've committed to providing palliative care to all of our residents in Dufferin County, which is really exciting. Some hospital facility improvements that we currently have underway. Um, you know, several months ago, we, piled, we partnered with the Smile Zone Foundation and that's a foundation that supported us uh, in the past as well, but most recently they did a complete refresh of our pediatric space in our hospital, as well as two family rooms. And you can see a picture of that up top. They you know, painted and brought in large colorful murals, uh, right to new paint on the wall, and they also supported with some electronic devices for kids and new TVs and furniture. So it has really brightened up that space, which is exciting. We are currently undergoing our lobby renovations to create a new welcome center. You probably recall, if you've been to Headwaters, the, the dangerous spiral staircase that we used to have there. That has been torn out now. Uh, we're gonna build a brand new safe um, staircase and as well a new uh, upgraded gift shop and ca cafe shop and then also uh, central reg registration kiosks. I will be there and you can pay your bills right as soon as you walk in the lobby, register for appointments. It'll be very, very seamless and very patient and family friendly. Our emergency department, um, you heard me speak earlier of our increased volumes, which are more than double. Uh, that space does need to get upgraded and enlarged. We are in the final processes of receiving a ministry approval uh, to proceed with those rentals. Those will take about three to four months. So we're excited about that. And I should mention that the, the Welcome Center renovations and the emergency department renovations are all graciously being supported by our foundation and auxiliary and donations from the community, which is wonderful. Our friendship gardens uh, continue to be uh, an amazing sanctuary for our patients and families and staff, all of us. I have to tell you when I um, first arrived at Headwaters, and I am from the region, but to get a tour you know, of the gardens with Lynn Sinclair Smith, it's just, it's unbelievable. Every room has a view. Uh, there are gardens that are, you know, in memory of folks that are, have contributed or have been, you know, longstanding community members. It's just, it's amazing the work that is done in the gardens and, the, and truly the, the sanctuary and the relief that it provides to all of our patients and families and staff. Um, in terms of some other opportunities and, and areas that we were working together, so I talked about the Ontario Health Teams and how we're working towards that, partnering with a number of our communities. Um, as well, there are some you know, changes, other changes that are occurring um, in the environment. You may have heard about public health and the restructuring that the province is looking at there, potentially going from 35 public health units down to 10. Potentially, they're also looking at um, ambulance services and looking at consolidating those as well. Um, along with the Provincial Ontario Health One organization that they're gonna create, they are also looking at dividing the province into five uh, regional or regions or health regions. Uh, for us in Dufferin County, what that means is that we will actually become part of one with uh, three other Lynn areas, but in terms of municipalities, it, you know, it will include York, Simcoe, Dufferin, Peel, and Halton will actually fall within the biggest region in the province. And so we'll just have to make sure that the voices of our you know, smaller communities as compared to, to some bigger yeah. ones are still heard and our needs are still heard and met. Uh, we continue to advocate for uh, medium-sized hospital funding uh, to be fixed or corrected. You may have seen our announcement from Friday that uh, we did receive word from our MPP, Sylvia Jones, uh, in our local health integration network that we will be receiving 2.7 million. Um, at this point, that is one-time funding. We are still gonna advocate that that becomes base. So going forward in future years, so we will still continue to advocate and that the, the funding formula for hospitals gets corrected as well for medium-sized hospitals. Uh, mental health and addictions is another area that um, we continue to work on. 
um, you know, we do have some great providers, some, some great internal work happening, but it is definitely an area where we could provide more integrated, better service to those patients and families. So that is one of our priority areas. Uh, this is the medium-sized community hospital funding issue that I spoke about. I won't spend a lot of time on this, just to say that it is historical. Um, and it just shows you how, you know, in the province, medium-sized hospitals are actually the most efficient. Um, you know, one could say that, you know, we provide the highest quality care for the, for the lowest price. However, the funding formula over the years has put us in um, a situation in a predicament where our working capital is very low and the formula does need to change, <coughs> even hinder the most. Um, I wanna spend some time just acknowledging at our annual general meeting this year, um, we provided some awards to some really great community people. Uh, top left there is Tom Reed, who is with us today, uh, and Dr. Tom Willens, and they were recipients of our David Scott Award uh, this year, so really happy to, to celebrate that. Uh, top right there, that is Eileen Dahl and her husband. She is one of our patient and family advisors. Um, she is part of our Ontario health team work and our collaborative work. She's one of our patient and family advisors inside the hospital. She most recently was the first patient and family advisor to be part of a panel down in Toronto. Um, it's an event called Breakfast with the Chiefs, put on by Longwoods. Uh, first ever patient and family advisor to be on a panel like that, uh, which is amazing. Uh, bottom left, we have Stacy, who is a Dufferin paramedic, who actually uh, ended up going to uh, do a home, a home visit, well, a visit actually for an emergency where the woman was having abdominal pains, did not know she was about to have a baby, so helped successfully deliver that baby. Um, so that's amazing, and that family uh, came into the hospital a couple weeks later to really uh, give their thanks. And then bottom right there, uh, that's the Jennifer Widber group. That's the Honeywood Hockey Moms started the Jennifer Woodward Memorial Hockey Tournament to support our hospital for over 12 years. This was the last year, but over the past 12 years, they have raised $652,000 to support our hospital, which is just amazing. So, you know, where do we need your support? What does, what does our presentation here today, you know, hope to to garner with you folks, you know, so till we could continue our joint advocacy efforts related to health system restructuring, reform, you know, to make sure our voices is heard, to make sure that, you know, our Dufferin paramedic services are really great. They're integrated with the hospital. They provide great service just to make sure that what they're proposing there uh, doesn't negatively impact us and our services. Uh, public health, again, even with, um, you know, the regional restructuring that's happening, I think it's just important to make sure that our voices and our needs are always heard and that we continue to advocate for bringing care closer to home. Um, yeah. And then lastly, we are always looking for volunteers to be part of our patient and family advisory, to volunteer, to donate. Uh, and of course, if ever you have an experience at our hospital and want to share any feedback with us, we're always open to that as well. Thank you for your time today. Thank you very much for your presentation. Are there any questions for Council? Councillor Nix? <coughs> yeah, I don't know too much about the subject, but I, I'm intrigued about these help for these teams that you talk about. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not quite sure I understand it. Does that mean the hospital as an entity is teaming up with other agencies? Like, w w w give me an example. Like, Yes, yeah, so stores or retirement yeah. homes. Or so, who, who, so, what's a team? It's a great question. So, um, I'll give you a bit of background, then I'll bring it down to the team. So, the province, there are 14 LINs right now in the province, that, um, and then there's Cancer Care Ontario, eHealth Ontario, the Trillium Gift Foundation. There's a number. They're going to all integrate to become one big, en big entity called Ontario Health. And then, underneath Ontario Health, the province is going to be then divided into five regions. Uh, which are going to oversee the funding and flow of money to hospitals, long-term care, community support service agencies, um, mental health addictions agencies, and then underneath that, the province is going to be covered. This is the plan by Ontario Health Teams, and what these teams are are so initially they signaled that they were looking for hospitals to come together with primary care providers and home and community care. 
home and community care currently sits under LINS and home and community care are the service providers that go into your home. So like the St. Elizabeth's, the VONs, the Bay Shores, they're the nurses, the personal support workers that go in. They said that initially you need to have at least hospital partner with primary care and home and community care to form an Ontario health team. Um, so what we did in Dufferin County, and, and ours is actually Dufferin and Caledon, uh, we actually invited all of the partners who are currently providing service in our area, so within health, uh, initially to come together to start looking at partnership opportunities. <coughs> at the fullest maturity, there will be a geographic area attributed to each Ontario health team. So for us in Dufferin Caledon, it's about 112,000 residents that cover, so, and we'll be responsible for providing all of the health care for them. Does that just mean you're, you're a group talking to each other more, or does no. it mean you... So you, at maturity, it means that there will be one funding envelope and one accountability agreement with the Ontario Health Team and Ontario Health. So what, so that they, they one envelope. One envelope, and then who decides within that envelope the hospital gets this much, VON gets this much. And there will be a board. There will be a board that we are going to have to uh, pull together that will oversee the work of the Ontario Health Team and will help provide that guidance and oversight. Okay, that, this board will have some administrative responsibility against the number of each of the hospitals. <coughs> yes, it, it will be. It, the board will oversee all of the funding for the whole geographic area and the population. Now that that's at fullest maturity. This is that's years down the road. So there are some, you know, kind of year one deliverables by the end of year one, and that's after you actually become officially designated by the province. So potentially next spring you could be designated as the Hills of Headwaters Collaborative Ontario Health Team. But a year from there, we actually just need to identify who the fund holder will be, uh, and we'll have to all agree to sign on to an accountability agreement. And and we have not figured that out yet. We have just pulled together a governance working group and we're going to have to figure that out with all of our partners. How that board will, will um, be comprised, how many seats, the process for all of that. It's, it's really big. It's a, it's a big integration that is going to happen across the province. <laughs> Happy to chat with you after that. Councillor <laughs> Mitchell. Uh, thanks for your presentation. It was great. Um, Fundings are going to be your continuing big, big problem. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, having worked in the healthcare field a bit, I recognize that the strength of the teaching hospitals and specialized hospitals and uh, all their graphs go this way and the medium sized hospital goes this way. <laughs> so you, you've got a big, a big issue, and advocacy, advocacy is going to be a big part of it. And probably this will happen a little bit through the funding envelope, I, I suspect, because it's going to be. I would hope. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, um, I just have um, um, one comment. I think I think that the uh, uh, strategic plan is good. Um, I have had some personal uh, experience with the hospital, and and the strength of the hospital are, are its people. You know, mm -hmm. and 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 I um, have to say that I was very impressed with the caring that people give. And if you don't have that, you you don't have a good hospital. And so whatever you do is going to have to have to be always thinking about supporting your staff and keeping their motivation in the direction of that uh, presently is, which is, I think, really, really excellent. Uh, your funding is about, mm, I think, 70% it comes to the Ministry of Health and Long-Term mm -hmm. Care. So that's a big piece that you also have mm -hmm. to continue. Uh, you have a, have a very good um, uh, foundation, and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm impressed with the uh, uh, the work that the ongoing work they're doing, and uh, I think that's, a, that's one of our, our big strengths. Thanks. I would agree, and if I could just add, um, so you know, this is my fourth week at Headwaters as interim president and CEO. But I have to tell you, each and every day, I either take the stairs or I take the elevator down with someone, and I always say, "So, how long have you worked here?" Um, last week, I rode down an elevator with a lady that works in our diabetes education center, and I said, "So, how long have you worked at Headwaters?" And she said, "Only 23 years." And then, and then a few days before that, I attended a retirement for a nurse, 30 years. So our strength is our people. I could not echo more. Um, I've been going around on tours, meeting physicians, volunteers, all the staff. And like, I think we should do a calculation on the average tenure of someone there. Like it has to be over 15 years. Like I can't tell you how many physicians I've met, you know, 30 years. 
live in the community com fully committed to that hospital and ensuring that it is the best community hospital around. So I just, I'm impressed every day with, with the people and the commitment there. And, and that is our, you know, our second strategic direction, our nothing about you without you. It is really important to us. Even when we received the influx of money or the announcement that the money was coming in the 2.74 million, we've already started to think about how can we get staff, physician, engagement on you know what are if there's any excess after we address our, our structural deficit how can we get their input on what is this investment most needed for to ensure that we still provide the highest quality care Deputy Mayor yeah, thank you for your presentation uh, what per percentage of your patients both inpatient outpatient uh, come from Paladin out of curiosity that is a great question, John, and I can't answer that offhand right now. I don't know if Jen can, but I, I will certainly, we can get that. Yeah. We can, you know, follow My, up with you. I was on the hospital board for six years, many, many years ago. Uh, and I recall it being in the range of 20% back yeah. then. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if it's, if it's greater now. Yes. Um, I hope you have an opportunity to make this presentation to Caledon Council yes. because yeah. we have a date in December. That's right, per, December seventeenth. That's yes. great. Yes. Because we went and, and Tom will remember this. We had such difficulty getting Caledon to the table when Headwaters was being built to make a financial contribution. Uh, the county uh, contributed six million dollars, which we were able to build interest on and it ended up being over seven million dollars towards the construction of headwaters and I don't remember uh, what Calvin did frankly or Peel Region mm -hmm. but I think it's really important when we're facing all of these mm -hmm. momentous changes uh, that they are uh, involved and, and feel involved because they will carry great political clout uh, that we will need uh, to continue to get people's attention. Absolutely, and I will just add that uh, for our Ontario health teams, so our partners down south, so Willie Mosler um, Health System, they also submitted an Ontario health team application and they were looking at their geography at the same time we were looking at ours. And I will tell you, Caledon did have a decision to make. Do they want to come north with us? Uh, and we were asking them to consider coming north because there is a natural flow and we'd like to capture even more. Um, and they did uh, make the decision to partner with us which is great, so very excited and hope to capture more of the market share there because we do know that some of them still do go south for some services, but we'd like them to all come north to our great facility. Thank you very much for your uh, all of this information. It's, it's fascinating to see what's going to be happening. And one of the things we rely on going into the hospital is what you're talking about is the kindness and mm -hmm. uh, consideration that patients get. And I have a fear that when we push everything together, mm -hmm. that sometimes what happens is there are all the efficiencies and the patient sort of sitting there. And also I want to say that um, uh, I've had really good feedback about what happens in the emergency department, it's fantastic. It's uh, a great place to go if you have to. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much thank for taking the time you. and for the rest of your team yes. and attendance. Uh, it's nice to have the update uh, given to us personally. Yeah, and, thank you. And uh, we will continue to uh, look for great things. And, right. uh, thank you. Support Thanks for your time this morning. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, so now we're on to the 2020 budget. So, Mr. Luca, did you want to guide us through this, or are we just going by department head presentation? Uh, each each department head will present their own capital budget. Okay. Uh, it's a process that's you know we've adopted in, in previous years that we put forward capital projects from each department. Uh, it's an opportunity for council to uh, tell the department, okay, did you consider another project that may not be on the list? So that way we'll get it on the list and then it'll be in the, part, in the draft budget coming to council in November. Or there might be a project that council might say, there's no way we're doing that. 
it's not a priority for us. So this is a, a kind of like a wish list, but well, maybe that's not a good word, but it's a list of, of projects that at the staff level we have identified uh, and then it's council basically kind of say, okay, put, put everyone's uh, list at the, at the full budget stage and then at that point, council can make a decision then. But this is basically what we will see in the upcoming budget in November from each department. Okay, so uh, you're up first. So I'm up first. Uh, technically, under capital budget definition, uh, what I have listed on my uh, project list isn't capital, because capital is usually a tangible asset. But this is more kind of ongoing uh, when it comes to computers and software. Uh, the world's moving away from a actually buying software, we're, we're finding we, we have to lease it, or we pay annual license fees for it. Uh, uh, so that kind of approach is now we're, we're replaced by software. Uh, the list here is uh, ongoing, uh, uh, I guess, program that has been in place for a while. And then last year, uh, we beefed up our internet and email security uh, with, with all the different hackers in the world and different mystalities getting hacked. Uh, the first cost uh, was for computer hardware and uh, uh, any kind of software software replacements. Um, last year's budget was 20. Uh, I'm proposing 25,000 for 2020. The additional 5,000, we're, uh, we're at a point uh, that we have to update our payroll software. Everyone's going to the cloud these days, and we're still at that desk base. And I mean, we can continue with the current payroll, but we would have no support, technical support. But sometimes you do get when uh, government rates change and there's new formula, we, we need that kind of support. Uh, now with this payroll update, we have the opportunity uh, to move towards a computerized timesheet. Uh, right now, the timesheets are done manually, comes with the payroll, it's added up manually. This way, uh, the hourly worker would go at the end of the day to, to a desktop and punch in their hours and actually for every hour or every whatever section, section of time, he could alloc uh, there'd be a drop down menu where they could allocate to what, to what activity. So, so it makes payroll far more efficient. And then, that, and then once that time card is completed, it comes with the payroll and then payroll is processed. To do that, uh, most we have already staff at the, at, the, at the rec halls, and then of course the public work workers. And the numbers increase over the winter time with the seasonal health problems and maintenance. We're looking at, at the very least, uh, setting up three workstations over at the shop. Only because at the end of the day, we don't need, I lost track how many guys are there. There's about 12, between 12 and 14 guys trying to punch in their hours. So this will allow time for people to go in. Uh, that additional cost for the three workstations is about $5,000. For network security, uh, uh, we started the program last year. Uh, the software is called Dark Trace. The annual license fee uh, is, is the $15,265 in that of our tax rebate. We had budgeted uh, last year $19,800. We were able to obtain a better deal on an annual basis because we, we gave them a, a five-year commitment. So we are able to save about $4,600 a year. Uh, as well, last year we started the backup to the cloud. It uh, gives the far more flexibility if we ever do get hacked that we can go back almost forever until the time we take, put back up to find where our data was, uh, say, virus-free, and it's really easy to uh, back up your system. And of course, it happens automatically. Uh, in the past system, we had a, a hard drive that we had to put into a machine. Sometimes the power went out, that would throw off the backup, whereas this way, there's, there's no issues with it. And then that cost, an annual cost, is approximately $9,400. And then ongoing, uh, you find the pit here. I've always been asked why is the gravel pit under admin? Uh, historically, the clerk's department owns the pit. Um, so every year we set aside $10,000 towards a reserve for future uh, rehab on the pit. Second. 
Just a, a general question. Um, are there any savings to be had uh, by um, cooperating with uh, other Dufferin municipalities in terms of purchase of, uh, of software licenses or uh, security uh, measures or the cloud measures? Have we exhausted any possible um, opportunities there? Um, we had the, actually we always had that similar question from the previous deputy mayor, so it's kind of nice getting the same. <laughs> it's continuing. Uh, we do look, we do work with the county quite extensively, and with the town of Orangeville. Uh, we share ideas. Uh, working obviously, Orangeville is running our water system, so we're working together with them in our SCADA, SCADA update. Now that's a water budget, but we work with them. Uh, Jake does talk to the county as far as hardware purchases. Uh, but they seem to have a higher budget for software, or not for software, for hardware. So uh, we usually select, a, uh, I guess, a more eco economical price for our, for our hardware. But yes, we do talk to, uh, to our uh, partners. Any other questions of council? Okay. Thank you very much. And now we're on to recreation. Um, the recreation capital budget for this year um, reflects um, a few things where we need to um, rejuvenate, I guess is the best word to put it. Um, starting at Menora, um, Menora is now, um, believe it or not, 31 years old. And um, <laughs> The, the deck that's there is the original deck. Um, we have been, as necessary, trying to replace a board or two, um, but it's come to the point now where the number of the boards on the deck have become soft, they're, um, they're needing to be replaced. So over the course of the summer, we've had a number of contractors come in and take a look at the, the deck and um, they all assured us that the actual framing for the deck is still in, in good condition, that we wouldn't need to touch the frame. But a number, or the majority of the boards do need to be replaced. Um, what I did when I spoke with a contractor, myself and Dave Mikowski, um, we talked to them about the possibility of using the new composite decking um, as opposed to pressure treated wood. Excuse me. Basically, because of the composite decking being known as not needing to be painted or stained, literally no maintenance and um, lifetime warranty. What we did find out about composite decking, however, um, as I'm sure many of you are well aware, it is about three times the price of pressure treated decking, as well um, as the fact that it gets very, very hot in the summer, and um, which would cause a bit of a challenge for some of our renters. Um, so the prices that you see here are reflective of pressure treated wood um, to replace the boards. Unfortunately, we can't do this job in house. Um, these boards are just too big. This deck is just too big for Dave to be able to handle it on his, on his own. So um, we're looking at contractors to come in and do that. So that's um, an average price between um, the contractors that came in and gave us a price of what we did receive. The second part of that is the railings. Now the railings, um, the steel railings uh, at Menorah were installed in 2004, so they are 15 years old now. Now the actual integrity of the railings is still in good shape, but they are starting <coughs> to rust severely. Um, over the years, we've been trying to deal with the rust by painting them, um, but it's come to the point now where they actually need to um, be sandblasted and an epoxy paint applied to them. So I went back to the original installer, um, a Lego Steel, uh, and spoke to them, and they came out, and they um, actually will have to send the railings out themselves to be sandblasted. The railings have to be removed. Um, and uh, the new epoxy paint applied. So 
their price as you see is forty thousand dollars to do that um, in keeping with outside at menorah the dumpster enclosure um, this is something that uh, have been looking at for a number of years now and the enclosure has come to a point where there's a number of rotting boards um, and the hardware around in it needs to be replaced so now is the time and if we're going to be replacing those things now is the time also to think about um, relocating the dumpster um, my thought is to take the dumpster to the southwest side of the evergreens basically hide it in behind the evergreens and um, that way we would alleviate the um, or at least minimize the odor issues that we're finding with the dumpster in the summer months when uh, the you know people are putting their garbage out there from the weddings or the rentals um, as well as the recycling so um, and also it wouldn't be the one of the first things you see when you pull into menorah so the relocating of the dumpster um, is something that we would be able to handle in-house um, very fortunate to have Dave with us now who is a um, ex or a, a very good <coughs> car carpenter and uh, he's quite competent to be able to to do that job on his own so that price reflects that it would be in-house staff um, looking after that renovation staining of the building we stain the building approximately every three to four years the, the time has come for it to be stained again um, again a contractor would have to look after that um, conference room conference room um, the conference room, room would if the walls told me they would very much like an uplift and uh, as long as well as the uh, carpeting um, that's the only place in Menorah that still has carpeting uh, so we're looking at uh, repainting replacing the carpet um, with tile and just doing a, a general um, facelift on the conference room this, that's the conference room I'm speaking of is what we refer to as lower conference room B which is the small room on the lower level beside the multi-purpose room uh, the bank room kitchen fridge uh, now needs to be replaced I know the um, in the budget last year we had that we would be replacing that fridge this year that fridge held out for us however the bar fridge went on us about a month ago um, so I took that money and replaced the bar fridge and now we do need to seriously look at replacing the upstairs kitchen fridge Dave has been um, pampering it to keep it to keep it running um, which means taking a hair dryer to it um, probably every other week to try and keep the frost from um, accumulating on it so um, once and if council approves the budget I would that will be one of the first purchases made is a new fridge for the kitchen uh, the multi-purpose room floor um, takes uh, an incredible amount of abuse um, just through our different users and it has come to the point now where um, in order to keep it looking prim and pristine we do need to get it professionally sanded and refinished so in speaking with our contractor who looks after that he's quoted me the 11,500 to do so and the last three that you see are the um, regular reserves roof replacement um, chair reserve and the banquet room floor reserve um, the good news here is to let council know that uh, the money that we had put aside to replace the banquet room floor it this year um, upon further investigation it was found that we were able to salvage it and um, so instead of spending $35,000 we are refinishing it we're resanding and refinishing and we're also purchasing a piece of equipment to help maintain that floor which will alleviate the amount of water that is used to wash that wood floor so um, we're coming in under budget by about $15,000 on that one so your wood floor is actually for upstairs going to last according to um, our contractor another 20 years so 
starting next year, I'm looking at putting um, money into the reserve for 20 years uh, to hopefully have $45,000 by the time we, we do need to replace that reserve. I'll say you do because in 20 years I certainly do not plan on sitting in this chair. Um, <clears throat> Mono Community Centre. Um, deck maintenance, ongoing deck maintenance. Um, this is this money reflects what we need to replace the remaining deck boards. Uh, Dave has been able to do a lot of that work himself. That deck is of a, a size that he's been able to handle. But what he can't do is replace the deck posts. Um, they've now rotted and they're peeling. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and if we're going to be replacing the deck post, we may as well at the same time re replace the two light fixtures, which do not match, um, and uh, get the decks or uh, get the post stained as well. Lower washroom renovations um, looked ex extensively this year at um, trying to. Uh, renovate those washrooms into accessible washrooms and as a number of contractors said to me unless I am looking at doing a full accessibility renovation with door openers closers ramps etc why would I be renovating washrooms to make them accessible when you can't get into the building in the lower <coughs> level it's not accessible um, I then further investigated and found out that because we do have an accessible building, a rental facility being Menorah, um, that we are um, alleviated from the uh, need to have to make Mono Center accessible. So what I've put before you then is getting those washrooms renovated. <coughs> Basically they need a full overhaul to the tune of $24,000. Again, that would all be done in-house. Dave did the washrooms at Menorah this year and um, is quite happy to continue with those types of renovations for next year at Mono Center. Uh, vinyl tile in both stairwells. Um, the, the tile that we put on uh, probably 25 years ago on the floors in the front and back hallways is now starting to peel and to crack. Um, the stair noses are lifting, and at this point, um, if we're going to be doing that, the original railing in the back stairwell, which comes from, which is from 1987, it's the old wrought iron type railing, um, could be replaced as well. Uh, we're looking at to do the floor and the railings, $10,500. And the last but not least, our fridge in the upstairs kitchen. Again, it's been pampered over the years. That fridge hasn't been replaced in 30 years. We're looking at $4,400 to replace it as well. And then you're looking at your regular reserves. Moving on to the parks, Mono Community Center Park. Um, this is the park where we um, house the one of the large uh, the largest community skating rink and um, we also have the multi-purpose pad well that multi-purpose pad uh, which was originally constructed in 1999 the boards around the pad um, are now splitting they're cracked and um, definitely need to be repainted so in order to replace those boards um, again an in-house project uh, we're looking at ten thousand dollars and that would alleviate um, the number. There's, there's holes in those boards right now. Um, they are causing a liability concern. We're doing the best we can to, to remedy um, those concerns. Um, however, we're, it, it's come to the point where we need to look at doing the whole um, multi-purpose pad boarding again. Mono College Park, also known as Col Cardinal Woods. And this is... Um, the swings, the, the actual playground, when we put the playground in back in 2013, we did put a rubberized surface in, in which is uh, the, the most, the best I can say about that, it's phenomenal. Um, we put it in as well out at Mono Community Center at that park. <clears throat> Any problems I've ever had with it, with it, which have been few, I've called the contractor who put it in and immediately goes out and remedies 
um, whatever my problems are. So little, no maintenance, absolutely no maintenance with those. Um, where we did not put rubberized surfacing at the time we did this was underneath the swings and that was due to budget constraints for that project. And now <clears throat> in order to um, alleviate from having to rototill and um, the pooling that happens underneath those swings and just for um, concerns regarding liability, I'm asking council to um, look at removing the sand and replacing it with rubberized surfacing, which will be approximately a cost of $12,200. And playground equipment reserve for that park is $5,300. Lloyd Armstrong Park is in pretty good shape. We've got our ball diamond up there, um, which unfortunately does not get used a lot. Um, and Yes, there are some things that we could do up there, but until I, I see a strong need from the public, I'm not putting anything forward to council. Uh, Island Lake Family Park. Okay. Um, Island Lake Family Park. Well, first thing first is your playground equipment reserve. That's your annual reserve for that, 7700 And then the following um, numbers are numbers that require late to the resolutions made by council um, regarding that park on changes that you wanted to see. And these are um, new numbers or numbers that are the same, um, but just reflect the changes that council wanted. So, <coughs> uh, I think the biggest one here was the paved parking lot um, for 12 vehicles right at the entrance and with single lane access and that now has been reduced down to $27,000. So council, um, we also removed the lighting from the walkways. Um, you had um, indicated that you no longer wanted walk walkway lighting. <clears throat> so that has been removed as well. and. So the new estimated budget, including engineering project management costs, is 587 for the Island Lake Park. Um, Fieldstone Parkette. Um, again, we removed the, multi or the basketball playing area and the three-hole disc golf. Kept in the sun shelter, the seating, and the accessible path to get to the playground and um, we're looking at just shy of 200,000 for that um, area now. Um, just as a little bit of um, extra information, uh, the Director of Public Works and our um, acting CAO right now, we have been in meetings with our engineers and um, that park is, as council asked, the, um, the uh, what do you call it? The, topographic surveys are um, now underway for those parks um, as well as we've looked at um, we investigated um, three different or three locations for the Fieldstone Parkette yesterday and um, um, I will send you a memo in that regard as far as um, Fieldstone and what our engineers have indicated may be a possibility. Purple Hill Park, um, playground equipment reserve, uh, $12,500. Um, I will let council know that um, some of the residents have been in touch with me from Purple Hill Park, and that is where one of our ice rinks, we have three ice rinks in total um, within our recreation field and um, Purple Hill Park being one of them. That is the only ice rink though that is not on a multi-purpose path. So I have heard but I have not had anything in writing given to me um, but I'm just letting you know there is some um, um, some things out in the wind out there that there are residents looking at the possibility of coming to council and requesting a multi-purpose path for that park. 
I have not put anything in the budget in that regard because I have not, as I said, I have nothing in writing for him. I have no formal request at this point. Um, Medill Meadows Park, again, it's in great shape. $8,400 is your regular playground equipment reserve. Um, Menorah Park, um, what we have in here is um, a project that was actually in the 2019 operating budget. Uh, but when I went to do the project, I thought um, I would prefer to bring this project into the capital budget um, because it is over $5,000. And um, so $8,500 has been given to us as the number to regrade the roadway from the lower um, parking lot, that roadway that goes just about to the corner before you turn onto the the dam or the road crossing to the pond, that road gets used by um, a number of maintenance vehicles. Basically, um, the chantlers who come in and um, maintain the portalet once a week throughout you know five months of the year, and they tend to really eat up our little driveway there. And um, it's in pretty rough shape right now. So that driveway definitely needs to be regraded. It needs a load of gravel put on it. And um, while doing that, economies of scale tell me that now is the time in order to be able to um, get, uh, allow people to get to our picnic shelter and to our gazebo um, for accessibility purposes to build an accessible path to both of those areas. So to do those two things um, and build those two paths, we're looking at $8,500 in total. So I wanted to bring that to Council's attention. And um, at this point, that's the Recreations Capital Budget, unless Council has things that I've missed or things that come out of the woodwork on us at the last moment. Councillor Martin, would you like to ask a question? Thank you. Um, uh, one, I'm just curious about the um, the deck at uh, Menorah. Uh, don't isn't there something that they can put on after a year when you put down um, um, the, the put down the decking, the pressure treated decking? Isn't there something that can go on that? I'm I'm sure that there's, isn't there something that goes on it, like a stain or something that can go on, not the first year, but subsequent years? Isn't there something that can do that? That yeah. would help it last a little longer, maybe? There is, and, and we have been okay. putting those items on there. We've just gotten to the point where, because of wear and tear, and yeah. we've gotten to a, a safety issue out there now. And um, you might know that moving that dumpster and closer. Five years, here we go. Thank you very much <laughs> for putting that in there. Um, uh, can I just keep going? The, the washrooms uh, down at uh, Mono Community Center, um, could the doors not be made wider? I mean, there are times when I, I know that uh, there are people who can help someone get through a door if they're in a wheelchair or something, but if the doorways were a little bit wider, it might be helpful for that. It's just a, a thought. I don't, it's not making it accessible to everyone, but it certainly would help if you were pushing a wheelchair through that door, which is very difficult to hold, get the door get the chair in, all of that kind of thing, if there was a possibility there. So just something to think about. And that, um, oh, I'm really glad that something's going to be done with those at, Mono, at uh, Mono Center. Those back stairs have taken a terrible beating with sand, water, and grit over the years. Sometimes just going up during the winter is a, a challenge. So I'm really glad to see that that's in there. Hopefully it all stays there. <laughs> that's all. 
Oh, thank you. A um, couple of things. The, when these numbers come back to us as part of the, the budget, uh, they're all sourced to the extent that we know that money is coming from the reserve and money is not coming from the reserve. So in, 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 your, uh, uh, in your indications there, we see that uh, uh, Menorah Park, for, for example, is asterisk. Uh, these funds will be taken from uh, 2019 reserves. But the Island Lake project is, is basically uh, funded by development charges and or reserves. So there's other things in there that I take it are coming from reserves that aren't indicated as coming from reserves at this time. That, that's correct, and that will be reflected when Les presents you with the completed budget where he has, um, <clears throat> I mean, Les, if you want to jump in here, but we've always there's always a category or there'll be the expenses and then at the bottom, it less always notes how much monies can come from reserves. And, and the the um, the items where you refer to uh, being done in house uh, are the dollar amounts reflective of the nominal uh, uh, salary uh, cost, as well as the uh, outlay for say the boards for the skating rink. That's correct. It is. Okay, so it, it, it it's not really a cost in as much as we have somebody uh, in house who. Is being paid a salary and would be deployed to do that work. That, that's that's correct. Our labor is much less than what a contractor's labor would be. And and a third uh, a third comment, and, and this would apply for the public works list as well. Um, you probably have priorities. You probably have things that you feel must be done, and other things that could be deferred. Uh, I think that for the budget discussion list of priorities or, or a way of prioritizing projects uh, is a really good idea because you know best uh, what uh, we absolutely have to do and what we could, uh, uh, we could defer to another time. Okay. Uh, I was just curious about this issue with Fields Road Parkette. Um, is, I don't, I, is it a big possibility of, well, you know where council is that is, is there something wrong with that location? Um, actually, that is the location of choice um, by our engineers and by the landscape um, designer who was out there yesterday. Okay. Um, we also, I mean, I'll, I'll give council a verbal on that. We also looked at um, going over to the water treatment plant, but because of um, limitations as far as area, because of um, limitations as far as not knowing when we would be able to do it because there are four more septic beds I believe it is that have to be installed out there um, <clears throat> and because of possible wetland issues out there uh, the engineers and the landscape designers um, were strongly recommending that we do not go into that location also if you put out there you know kids would have to cross French Fry. Right? That's yeah. correct. That's correct. Um, as far as, um, what do you call it, um, beautificate, beaut or the, the, the beauty of your landscape, um, the locations that we originally chose far surpassed looking at Highway 9 and the back of the new storage building that's being constructed because that's exactly what the view would be. Um, we also looked at possibly going back to the original thought, which was where the gazebo is presently situated. And uh, the general thought there was, unless we can work some type of playground into the actual um, landscape that is presently there, um, in other words, doing a natural playground of some type, um, because of the issues of the um, the pond right there, um, would that be such a good idea as opposed to the site where we chose when we went on our walk? Um, which when the landscape designer saw that site, he was blown away. He said, why would someone not put a park here? So in a nutshell, that was what was talked about yesterday. 
Well, that was a whirlwind. Kim? Well, I have a few questions. Um, the, uh, the decking and the uh, railings, uh, the, the uh, $40,000 estimate for the re <coughs> removal of sandblasting and painting, um, I don't know whether you're familiar with uh, powder coating, but it's uh, something I've just bumped in because I'm having some railings made. It's a, a baked on finish that lasts virtually forever. I don't know whether powder coating can be done on, on old metal that's being uh, sandblasted, but uh, with that pricing, I would think it would be uh, probably quite competitive. Um, the moving down to um, uh, yeah, on Lake Family Park. Uh, what uh, landscaping is something we've talked about before, and, and I've commented on on it. Um, and we have a an estimate here of eighty thousand. And I just like to know what what that involves. Well, the eighty thousand dollars can involve anything from tree plantings to um, oh, gosh, um, what did we talk about yesterday, Mike? If I can, you'd have you'd have some screening areas for um, your tennis courts, okay. um, general land site development. Uh, respect to uh, tree covers and trying to picture frame the rear yards that are existing uh, to sort of block out structures that are being built but not block out views to the to the lake and, uh, and items such as that so and I, I don't mean to be um, critical but this is a, a kind of a, a basket. We don't want to actually know what the plan is with respect to specific trees at least. Because you once had a risk of a certain amount of trees. I, I, I will say um, yesterday during our um, meeting with uh, the engineers and the landscaped um, designer they were actually surprised at the minimal amount that we have put in there. Um, they were you know, indicating to us um, that to truly landscape a park so that rather than just have a field with, with equipment in it or structures in it, you want to be able to beautify it. And this is one of the big things where um, um, when people design parks, they, they fall back on is they forget about the beautification of the park. It's not just structures and it's not just play features. You, you do have to make it welcoming to come and have some trees and, um, and uh, shrubbery and, and you know, there are areas where we are going to, as um, um, our director of public works referred to, we're going to have to block some maybe parking um, facilities from people's sight lines, that kind of thing. So. I, I suggest to council that, that that amount at least stay where it is. And should um, we not spend it all, I would be very surprised, but I'm sure council would be pleased if we don't. But I agree with the, the philosophy. I'm just looking for something more specific when, in terms of, um, you, I, I gather you haven't really cost out individual items yet. No, but we will be bringing a, um, a new plan, uh, a one one more final park plan to mm -hmm. council for your approval, um, which will have some some of those things indicated on it. Since we've um, planned on putting in a uh, a playground, um, I've been noticing playgrounds, <laughs> and I notice there's quite a bit of variety in what's included in them. And do you have a, a particular plan, like having Say slides, swings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, in this nine, I think it's one hundred ninety-five thousand view. But can you tell us what, what what's involved for that? What, what's what included? Sure. When you when you install a playground, what will happen? This will become part of the RFP, um, and playground contractors will come to us with a design. We will then look at the design and we'll see how many features each one of the contractors have 
include it in their design and basically we'll look at the best value for our dollar for that actual design. Now they are Okay, we'll resume um, our meeting. Now, because we are going to be going into a lot of discussion, uh, I was wondering if uh, our representatives from the Heritage Committee, would uh, you be willing to have the item moved up and also would council members be all right with that? Okay, so we will um, look at new uh, business additions to the agenda. So that's the Heritage Advisory Committee regarding the Globe Restaurant Heritage designation. And thank you very much for that in-depth report. And uh, was there any comments from council members on the item? Just a comment, which I, I, I did tell uh, Kirsten personally that this is a, a large body of work, an awful lot of uh, effort is put into it, um, and it's appreciated. And um, it's nice to see uh, because uh, I think our heritage is a really important thing. We all feel that way, I'm sure. And um, uh, we haven't had the opportunity to uh, uh, have a heritage designation for quite a few years, certainly not during my last term on council. Okay. Yes. I think it's great work and, and the museum is involved in some of the, the work. How many how many designations do we currently have in the town? I think there's ten. They're all all of them are hanging in the hall. Reflected in the, yeah. in the top mm -hmm. yeah. Up with them, which my house is one. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Kirsten. Okay. Yes. No, go ahead. What is I, I just wondered what is the practical I, I know I should know the answer to this question. What's the practical impact? If if it gets the heritage designation does that put constraints on what the owner can do to that building? Because the reason I ask is I, from the report, my understanding is there's, not, there's nothing in the interior, I, I mean, that, that is, was original, and I'm not sure of the outside. So what's the practical consequence of design, designating this building? Right, that is a good question, and that is usually the question that every owner asks. They say, what, what, what are the restrictions that this will bring to my life and my property? Um, <laughs> Once a building is designated, it cannot be demolished. I mean, you can reverse a designation. It doesn't happen very often. Um, so it's protected in that sense. In terms of uh, alterations and modifications to the building, you can, in fact, make changes to the building. But if you want to do an addition or if you want to demolish anything, you must bring your plans to the Heritage Committee and get their, not even necessarily their approval, but their input. The, the Heritage Committee will encourage you to um, choose design features that are sympathetic or complementary to the original building. So the intention is, is not necessarily to completely restrict the building, but it's rather to, uh, rather to control the changes that are made to the building over time. And of course, it can't be demolished, which is the main thing. The current owners want this designation? Yes, they do. Why? Uh, <laughs> well, they initiated the designation. They came to us and asked for it. Um, I believe that she wants it, uh, you know, she owns three other buildings on that corner. I mean, I think she owns quite a few buildings there now, but the three, three main buildings. Um, and I believe that Janice, um, you know, I think she just recognizes the importance of, of heritage and that this is a little uh, sort of pioneer heritage enclave. And I think she just wants to formally recognize it. I'm, I'm not entirely clear of any other motives that she has. Um, 
really the Heritage Committee, we're not concerned with her motivation. Um, we only need to assess whether the bu building has historical value, which it does, so. Um, we haven't had a designation in the past year. However, we have had um, people come with um, uh, proposing additions, ripping things down on houses that have uh, been designated, and we have responded to that. And uh, so, yes, that was that was done as well. And oh, by the way, they did because it didn't impact the um, the building. They were taking something down that, would, first of all, it wasn't in sight and it was in keeping with the building. So that's why it was, we said fine. So uh, we do have a motion that council receive the Heritage Advisory Committee designation report dated June 18th, 2019 and updated October 14th, 2019 and that council directs staff to issue a notice of intent to designate 995-722 Mono Agila Town Line, part lot east half lot 32, concession eight e EHS, also known as the Globe, under part four of the Ontario Heritage Act, as recommended by the Town of Mono Heritage Advisory Committee, and that the clerk proceed with the notification requires as set out in the Ontario Heritage Act. Could I have a mover? Moved by Martin and seconded by Creelman. Any further discussion? All in favor? Carries. Thank you very much for your work. Okay, so now we're going to go back and listen to our Director of Public Works on his list. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I, I'll probably do just a brief overview. As Council has seen a lot of these projects, um, on the last two pages of my report, you'll see that I've sort of identified, as Deputy Mayor has asked, I've sort of identified the priorities, um, but I can just uh, briefly go through them and, uh, and provide some highlights. Um, with respect to our yearly traffic counts, um, I noted in the, uh, my report on the seventh line speed, uh, speed delegation that uh, in the future and moving forward with all of our traffic counts, we'll now do a classification and speed as well. So instead of just counting the vehicles, we'll have the, the extra three pieces of data. Um, it seems to be, uh, it's within the, within the budget and it seems to be the, the want and it provides us with the information that we need. Um, bridge five, nine, 10 and 11, those are all the reserves that are going towards the eventual rehab or replacement of those structures. To note there, Bridge 5 is the bridge south of Singing Waters. Um, I've, I've, uh, I've put in, in the paragraph there a small suggestion that maybe removing the structure may be the best, uh, the best route, which leaves us with two dead ends. Um, I've struggled with this internally Bridge 19, which is the bridge on 7th line, uh, just at the Tim Hortons at Mono Mills. Um, Council will remember I talked about removing that structure altogether and we had a uh, um, 10 or so residents approach us and, and uh, we're very uh, concerned about it. Fifth line right now we have closed and we only have an access point from the seasonal road right now. And uh, I'm starting to think about the access and the safety of accessing residents' properties should we remove a structure um, in the event that there's a problem. So you'll probably see after I review the uh, fee draft feasibility study that's in, I'm starting to lean towards uh, rehab or and or replacement of these structures and keeping these seasonal roads open. Um, they just uh, provide an extra level of safety to, uh, um, to emergency access should there be flood damage or uh, or washouts. Um, uh, those structures are all 2021, 2022, and potentially beyond, uh, dependent on councils, uh, councils, uh, depending on the review and so forth. The uh, the trigger, uh, the big the big bridge, and and that's uh, being recommended to be done in 2020. 
is uh, item number seven, bridge 39. It was formerly presented to co council as a lot 27 culvert. If council will recall, we had two culvert failures on the Mono Town, Mono Agila town line. Um, both structures uh, uh, were missed on our asset management plan um, and they have now been uh, collected in and bridge 39 is in need of repair to be done in uh, in 2020. Um, it was 2018 when we first started acknowledged to council and uh, that's the structure that I'd like to see council proceed with in uh, in 2020. Blind line it's uh, it's always been in there we're uh, council approved last year to prepare the drawings for some of the uh, um, not the rehab, but the uh, but the to individualize the drainage issues that we're having on the blind line. Um, we're in final discussions with Bell to remove some of the utility issues that we're having. Um, not too happy with the price right now, so we're renegotiating with Bell right now with respect to getting the Bell cables out of the way, so we could facilitate the uh, the install of larger and uh, some doubling of culverts uh, to handle floodwaters. Um, that's being requested to be completed in 2020. Um, as council is aware, uh, Purple Hill subdivision, I'll call it part one, the, the southern portion, portion, the concrete roads were all removed and uh, asphalt and road base repairs were completed in the last couple of years. Um, I'm starting the same reserve that I started 10 years ago to replace the first uh, section and to start to look at the long-term replacement of the second half of the concrete roads um, uh, with a, probably a million dollar price tag associated with that in 2030. So um, that, uh, that first section was all completed by uh, council reserves over a 10 year period. Um, Rosemont Agila Town Line, council's aware of that. They've seen it uh, a couple of times. Um, and that, that job is tender ready and, and ready to go, subject to council approval. It was uh, recommended for last year and due to uh, financial issues, we, uh, we prolonged it uh, for another year. So that's on the table again. Gravel resurfacing, um, we'll have a joint tender this year. We're, gonna, we're still waiting for the spring results on our pressure run aggregate. Uh, we wanna see how that will react to we're, we're ecstatic with the results of it this year with respect to less potholes, less washboard. Um, so we'll have a joint tender. I'm hoping to, uh, the issue with the limestone crusher run is, is the location of, in the haul routes. Last year we were lucky enough that a local pit um, brought in a pile for us at a decent price and, and we're hoping that uh, we can maybe talk to uh, local aggregates to see if they'll uh, make it available for us to uh, start to uh, start to add it to some of the roads, which, uh, which council is aware we've seen some, uh, some very slimy issues um, in the spring, for lack of better words, with our, uh, with our existing OPS uh, product. Um, we have a reserve for resurfacing again, typical driver or typical, typical driveway culvert replacements. Item number 14 is the request for replacement of the, our 1997 grader. It's, uh, it's past its useful life and uh, we do have some recommendations in the next couple of years for transmission and tandem replacements and uh, transmission replacement on a grader is around $50,000 so we're, we're hoping that uh, the council will approve the replacement of that. That uh, is offset by equipment reserves which will be shown in the uh, <coughs> operation or the complete budget when presented to council. Item 15 is a, uh, a, a patrol pickup that's uh, starting to see increased maintenance costs that we'd like to replace. And number 16 is a, is a new item to council um, for the purchase of a, a sidewalk utility vehicle. Um, that would, uh, we're in our second year of rental on our sidewalk machines and uh, public works would like to see a purchase of that uh, into our fleet. And that is offset by, uh, I believe it's 90% offset by development charges for growth in the southern end. Um, continuation, uh, Public Works has, uh, has worked with an architect as approved last year with respect to the salt stand, sand storage facility in the southern, uh, southern end. Um, we have a uh, draft set of architectural plans and uh, I'd like to uh, 
probably be a report in 2020 with respect to uh, uh, purchase of land and or utilization of uh, town old land and council has always set aside money for the replacement of our fuel system that's uh, that's getting closer and closer I'm looking for a 21 replacement of that and that's uh, that's an old that's a very brief overview should council have any questions with respect to the individual items I'd be happy to uh, happy to answer just to the uh, salt sand storage facility in the south end uh, was development charge money coming to pay that that's been uh, in the development charges 2000 well, I can't remember if it's in 2010 but it's definitely in there 2014 and 2019 I'm thinking it's 80% covered less. I can't remember what the value was. 90% oh, 90% covered by development and it's strictly growth related. Council has increased our fleet size over the last couple of years with respect to the growth related uh, uh, purchases and uh, this is all part of the uh, level of service commitment for our southern end. The aged fuel pumps. I'd like to see something happen there. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I forgot one more thing. I don't know whether this is where you, you would put it, but um, <clears throat> uh, seasonal speed bump acquisition. I think they're going to find that Fred and I will be, uh, will be um, joining forces on that. and. I can think of a minimum of two, possibly three locations. I know you don't like them. <laughs> I would see that as an operational because I think we're talking seasonal. Um, I would see that uh, that purchase as a install and removal. I, I assume that's where you're heading for winter removals. Yes. And uh, and thank you. And uh, and I would see that as uh, I don't think that'll hit the capital threshold. Um, I'm not sure of the cost of them. I haven't uh, delved into that, but uh, um, that's uh, definitely something that would go into the safety devices line of the uh, of the operational budget. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, Mike, the uh, sidewalk utility vehicle. Um, what does what does that look like, and uh, would that be funded from a, a developer's reserve? So yes, it is it is funded from growth, um, except the portion that we would. There's a there's a further value to the town with respect to the purchase of that, which would be a sweep a sweeper. Um, council will recall a couple of years ago I talked about getting a sweeper for our loader. It just didn't receive good input from our uh, from our road staff, and the uh, and the longevity of that sweeper is costly and high maintenance so um, so yes it is covered by uh, covered by uh, development charge um, I don't know how to explain it um, it's not a tractor it's yeah um, so this is a cabbed unit obviously with heat um, and air conditioning but uh, but it does have the ability to spread sand and it has a blower a V plow and a multi-directional plow as well and it uh, has the ability to load snow into our tandem trucks for removal from subdivisions and uh, I could uh, I could def I didn't want to provide a picture because I'd almost be sh I guess I could provide multiple pictures of three different manufacturers um, I didn't want to provide a picture but I could definitely uh, I could definitely provide multiple pictures of multiple potential um, respondents to a tender should there be one. Presently for sidewalks are you using a, a plow or a blower or what are you using? Um, uh, both. Both. When, when blowers are required we are using those. We are using blowers to clear out in front. We are using the blower attachment to clear out in front of our fire hydrants. Um, <coughs> irregardless of where residents pile snow or we pile snow we will block our fire hydrants. So that is uh, that is utilized uh, uh, currently by our staff, and uh, and we use depending on the snow load, uh, we'll use blowers and or uh, and or directional plows. So this is a relatively narrow uh, vehicle that can 
Correct. So it's under 48 inches. That'll help. That'll help. definitely help. So it's under 48 inches. It's a, sort of a cab forward design. The cabs sit the, their, their rear engine, rear engine uh, machines. They articulate in the center, like similar to a loader. And uh, and we also, in the last two years, have rented the sweeper option at the end of the season for uh, when we do our bridges, we clean off the sidewalks, and uh, and then we to replace another rental machine that we do during the fall, we normally rent a, a skid steer and a, uh, and a, uh, a sweeper as well to do our bridges two or three different times a year. This would, uh, right now, the staff are hand sweeping the S-bends on our roads on Fridays to try and ensure motorcycle safety. Um, cars tend to hug to the inside corner, so so we're sweeping intersections, we're sweeping uh, sweeping bridges and sweeping uh, um, and this this machine would be able to traverse town wide as well uh, just just a couple of comments Mike I mean I can't dis disagree with anything you put here I I know when I look at the four hundred thousand dollars for bridge nine I, I guess the question that comes to my mind I remember when, when we had to do that bridge on the seventh line and I think there's two residents, so we did a, what, a million dollar bridge for two residents. But in that case, that that route, if if Highway Nine Airport Road is ever collisioned or, or blocked, it's the only way people can, can go north south. And I think that was part of the argument for not making two dead ends. But we, we had to go ahead with the bridge. And in, in the case of the line line, or or sorry, the one on um, here Ontario Street, have you at all talked? There's there's that that. Uh, uh, institution just just Singing, north of it, uh, Singing Waters. Singing Waters. I, I I assume most of their customers would come from Hockey Road up that way. I mean, if, if we were to make two dead ends, it would be a real inconvenience. But my actually, my question to you is: Have you talked to any of the landowners there in, in terms of keeping that bridge? We ju uh, no, I haven't. We just we just received the feasibility study, so I wanted to compare rehabilitation to um, to replacement. And there's also a cost with removal. Um, well, true. That's that's uh, that's why I'm asking for the reserve to continue. Is uh, we just can't leave it as is. There's thoughts that we could use it as a pedestrian bridge, perhaps for a longer period of time, um, and close the road <coughs> off from vehicular traffic. Um, but uh, but I haven't spoke with Singing Waters. What I do know about Singing's Waters is is when we do shut our uh, when we do shut the road down on December first. Some years it's been November fifteenth. Last year I think it was shut down November first. Uh, we were already we already had snow this time last year. Um, what I do know is they're very excited as to when we're going to open up the road um, because their traffic normally does come from Hockley. And in winter they come through for Highway Ten to Ten Side Road uh, back down. So. Uh, the other question I would have, which is something that you haven't gone on here, and I, I, I don't remember where we are with the county grant, but we don't have any charging stations for electric or plug-in hybrid vehicles in, in your capital budget. So if you... Are, waiting for, are we waiting for word from the county on that on that possible grant? And it, but, it, but, but, but my question is, if that grant doesn't come through, shouldn't we still be making plans, even if it's just starting to put money in a reserve for someday eventually putting in at three of our buildings uh, charging stations um, the charging station at the hall here would fall under the admin section oh. and or sorry and then the uh, two buildings would be would be recreational um, um, however um, council did review the county plan and uh, we are in the early stages of finalizing that agreement and I believe that they're looking for electrical capacity right now um, would have to be the requirement. Uh, we'll have electric, electrical capacity at the town here. Um, but council, I believe, approved two stations here. Two stations here, council approved uh, to go into um, partnership with the county. Well, they haven't heard back from the federal government on the grant yet. So that 
that was in the 2019 budget as a uh, uh, presented by CAO Mark Early, um, and that number is available. That that Mark had put in last year. Should council want to see it again, subject to the county installing their systems, I would think. Do we know by December? I don't know when the federal government intends on uh, making a determination on those grants. I have no idea. Well, I, 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 you know, I mean, of course, I may have a pecuniary interest here. I'm not sure, but since Bob is with everybody, yeah. But I, I mean, I, I do think. We should be making some plans for someday before I die to put in charging stations. Okay, and if we're not going to get the grant, uh, would it be possible, Fred, to take Mark's numbers from last year, which we, we eliminated, and put them in the, or maybe less, and put them back in the tentative budget? Okay, okay. Okay. All right. So it looks like you did well. Good. Okay, so if there's nothing further, we have a motion that council receives the 2020 departmental capital budgets. Do I have a mover, please? Moved by Martin, and seconded by Mangtolo. Any further discussion? All in favor? Carries. And now on to the cost of living allowance for the 2000, 2020 rate of inflation. And um, so we have our memo from Mr. Luca suggesting 2%. And you, you, okay, so you're fine with that. Wow. <laughs> okay, so if there's nothing further, we have a motion that council uses an inflation rate of 2% for 2020 budget purposes. Uh, could, it could could I have someone move it? Moved by Nix and seconded by Mangtolo. So this is simply to um, prepare a budget based on the assumption of 2%. It's not actual approval of the 2%. Right. It's the 2% I'll be using for, for budget purposes. And also, it's also um, for increases in staff salaries and council remuneration. And it's... It's a methodology that we've been using now. This is about the third term of council. And uh, we picked the same period. Uh, we, we look at the CPI from a year ago, October 2018, to the last posted this year. And we take the average of it. And it's been working pretty well um, because inflation does fluctuate month for month for month. And this is basically an average of 12 months. And if I could explain it a bit further. Um, when I was first elected to council, uh, the staff wages had been frozen. And we did a, um, a, I can't remember the exact percentage, just to, to make up for having their wages frozen for four years. Then the question became, well, what do we do in, the, in future years? And we seem to agree on this methodology. That we take the average of 12 months of, a, of Ontario Consumer Price Index, not seasonally adjusted. That's the exact same methodology for example, that the Canada Pension Plan uses in increasing pension, in, in fact, teachers' pensions, they all use that methodology. I, I would say it, it's it maybe not perfect, but every X number of years, then we hire an HR consultant who does the, you know, the comparison with other municipalities. And the last time, uh, my, we were very close to what that consultant showed in terms of our salaries compared to uh, our comparators. It, it works out quite close to um, what the increases they would get if we hired an HR consultant every year who did a, a study of comparators. Am I, am I correct, Les? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, in my previous career, we were subject to the same methodology, the same um, uh, numbers, quite frankly. Um, my question is, uh, and I've, I've never understood this decision being made uh, in advance of the budget. Um, I understand planning a budget and doing all the, the assumptions based on this, but when it comes to the budget discussion, uh, if we had to revisit a 2% adjustment, are we able to do so or are we locked into what we are doing today? 
Not long to the review. Okay. Yeah. I'm fine. So the, the motion does read that council uses the inflation rate of 2% for 2020 budget purposes. So just, yep. yeah, okay. Okay. So um, I'll call for the question. All in favor? Carries. And uh, Hockley Lands property, um, loss of rental income report. And is there any questions? Yep. Uh, I'm wondering whether this reopens the possibility of the uh, OPP having a, uh, uh, a, a perch uh, in that uh, in that building. Um, the police service board is is looking south end opportunities including uh, the county building uh, the courthouse uh, and uh, frankly if, if the space becomes available um, on Hockley uh, that might be a good place for a um, community uh, uh, presence for the uh, for the OPP if, if memory serves me I thought the OPP had investigated that building and were not happy with it uh, they they had, but I think they had investigated it from the standpoint of whatever space was left over from uh, the current usage, well, if the, if the, in the basement. So there would have had to have been a, an investment in in, uh, uh, in sprucing it up. Uh, but if if it turns out that we are without a tenant, uh, I think that changes everything from their standpoint. I could be wrong. My understanding is you are going to be without a tenant, so so you're definitely uh, at the end of the day it's council's building, um, and I don't think that uh, Dbot would be offended by this. They're sort of waiting to hear from uh, the town of Mono as well. So if council wanted that action, then I think that could be sent to uh, um, police services board and or uh, and or the OPP, uh, the, the proper person that would. Uh, would require that to notification that there is there is a space. Cheyenne, I believe this is uh, this issue is on our next uh, uh, police service uh, board agenda, um, and I was prepared to report that uh, uh, the county would be willing to uh, rent space, but they would be charging for it, uh, and maybe the better approach might now be to uh, to look at what's uh, what's available at the uh, the Baker House. I just throw it out there. Yep, definitely. So I think the biggest thing that the town would need to know is there any structural and or security issues that would be required structural changes to the layout uh, to facilitate uh, occupancy of the OPP? Yeah, I'm still not sure I totally understand. The, the board of trade people are still going to be there mm -hmm. and, and to cover the rent, which is going to raise to 12000 a year, they're going to tr try to get this business hub. I, I don't. I don't quite understand what that is. Is it? Is that a an entity, or, or is it just opening up some rooms for people to come in and yeah. for a certain fee? So they, they they would charge potential business. Uh, it could be single operators uh, or ones that don't require full time occupancy. Uh, so it would be um, available to, to have the internet connection uh, space and. They and, and how long are we giving them to find out if this model works? I mean, I, it, okay, if the model doesn't work. All right, for the first year, as I understand it, they're using some grant to offset the, 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 the rent. Is that is that a grant we give them? Well, that's, the, normally we set aside the 11,900 and some odd dollars. Um, so that's what Mark's memo is recommending that instead of setting that aside, that we utilize that funds to um, to pay for the rent uh, for the year, and uh, and they have to still be responsible for the entire sixteen thousand dollars plus or minus of uh, their utility costs, um, and then they would uh, with councils. They're looking for direction and approval for sense from council that they were open to this. Um, so then they would start to prepare their uh, their. Uh, their uh, hub, their business hub uh, plan, which would be submitted to council. And uh, my understanding is that they're really, they're hoping to attract 
uh, some home occupations that may be starting to bust at the seams, uh, maybe having internet uh, issues, and, and we try and open it up to the to the surrounding area for businesses to say rent a meeting room or a boardroom or or and I think they were looking at uh, uh, six month minimum terms, um, but that would come out in their uh, in their business plan. I just going on memory, I would point out that we were getting ten thousand dollars a year rent for that building. And that wasn't covering the cost of us owning that building. I mean, we had to redo the roof. We had to do a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, it, it really was a subsidy to, to, to the tourism and board trade people. And I, I'm not sure 12,000. I would think you'll see the operation in early discussions and review of the building with, uh, with uh, uh, Kim's staff. Um, I think you'll see that uh, maintenance bill come down. We had some, we had some insulation that we did. Um, the roof, uh, the roof will be back in 10 to 15 years. Um, typical of your own home, um, but uh, we did have some maintenance uh, items that we were dealing with. Um, there was uh, there were some purchases to finish off the renovations and in the basement. So um, you should see that uh, yearly maintenance cost come down this year, um, which will provide uh, provide a small revenue as opposed to a uh, as opposed to a break equal or a loss. Uh, I guess the other thing that me about it is, I mean, without the Board of Trade in there, <laughs> we've got a building gener generating no revenues at all and probably subject to things like vandalism and stuff. I mean, right? I mean what, what, what do we do with it if we don't have the Board of Trade in there? Well, we could still pursue other uh, entities that uh, would be interested, whether or not they are proprietors of a small business or if there's other community <coughs> groups that are interested and because uh, space like that is not uh, easily found at an inexpensive cost. So yeah and the Dufferin, the Board of Trade is, uh, whether there was rumors they were t contemplating leaving or not, those are not, those are bad rumors. Um, they're very happy with the, and they're very appreciative of, of the, the rental levels that are set right now. Um, I do point to number 18 in my capital roads plan that it calls for a salt sand storage uh, facility. So um, that is town land, but it is wetland, wetland heavy. But um, they are very, they are very appreciative, and, and the gut feeling I got was they want to make this a go and try and op this, uh, open this up. As for a timeline, I think if council was to approve and receive Mark's report, you're looking at basically. Uh, um, they should have this up and running uh, within the year. Because you, you'll be you'll be reapproached in 2021 with uh, potentially a different story or a good news story. I'm just trying to get a, a grip on the figures here. Um, at the present time, uh, the rent is 10,000, and the uh, board of trade is paying 5,000, I presume, and they're paying half of the expenses, which is. Uh, I guess eight, so that comes to thirteen thousand a year. Is that? And the other thirteen would go would have been covered by Headwaters Tours, right? And the per <coughs> the just to go back on the expenses, it, it does are the expenses the the usual expenses that we have of hydro, water, internet, um, heat, heating, taxes. Correct, and probably off they would have some office supplies in there, and uh, they they own their printers and their computers. And, so their their general cost to run the building for two two renters was sixteen thousand. Okay, and that that would likely continue. So the proposal it would be that we would uh, offset the uh, the two thousand twelve thousand uh, dollar rent with a grant, and that they'd be then responsible for sixteen thousand, which is thir thir three thousand more than previously. So they're they're happy with this. They know they have no other okay. choice because I mean, that they're not they're accepting asking. of it. I should say rather than happy. They're not asking the town to pay for utilities at all. They're tr asking us to reconsider our uh, our uh, rental rates for till they get uh, their business plan and model uh, back on their feet again. Um, Mark uh, Mark came up with the idea of the existing grant that the town already put towards Headwaters Tourism. Um, I'm not sure whether that portion of that went to Dufferin Board of Trade, but. Uh, um, but Mark came up with the idea of uh, the funding was already in place, set by previous councils and yourselves. 
um, to utilize that money to offset the rent to, to hopefully get them back on their feet and uh, and fill these uh, extra rooms and so forth. And so when they get back on their feet and they get the business hub running, it would once again be um, uh, self-supporting for the uh, total rent and total uh, business expenses. That's they the would, in theory, be the property manager, but at the end of the day, the town would approve the uh, the tenant, mm -hmm. and also uh, the lease would be signed with the town and not the uh, Duffer Board of Trade. Um, that would, uh, in the books, would have to be open to the town to see any uh, revenues above and beyond uh, the 12000 that would be, and Mark's asking that those be uh, uh, generated back to the town. It sounds to me like this is a workable financial arrangement um, but given John's um, comments about the police services uh, uh, perhaps they uh, they should be approached to see if they want to uh, reconsider this I don't know that it's a reconsideration so much as it's a, it's a, it's a <laughs> it helps them because uh, police services board could make the decision that we pay a, a nominal uh, rent or another location for the south end. Uh, certainly, the county was looking for some some money. I don't know how much, but um, if, if if the police become the first uh, uh, tenant of the uh, of the new arrangement, uh, I think that that helps. Um, the other possibility is that there will be a, a successor to Headwaters Tourism of some kind. Uh, it's not clear yet, but I can't imagine that we won't be doing something to promote tourism it's just a question of how uh, and if we we end up uh, finding a, an alternative and, the, and it's anticipated that there will be an alternative to headwaters tourism uh, they may come knocking at our door for uh, for assistance well my under my understanding is that the county has withheld these grants and is looking at doing this internally through their economic development uh, department okay. so so whether they I'm assuming they already have uh, location so they'll, they'll, they'll carry the expense yeah. as opposed to us giving the grant correct okay yeah well I'm all in favor provided they change the uh, format of the uh, all candidate meetings going forward <laughs> The Board of Trade. Yeah, that's right. The Board of Trade. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Sharon, did you have anything? Well, I was just curious if uh, Orangeville goes for the OPP, doesn't that change any uh, necessity for something in the South because they'd be taking over the uh, Orangeville uh, office, I would assume, or not? Well, it, it would. Uh, but that's some distance away. I mean, even even when they make the decision, there is a transition time, and uh, um, I, you know, I think this is something that could happen sooner rather than later, um, but then be revisited in the event that they they go uh, OPP and Orangeville. So uh, you would like uh, council to receive the report, or? It yeah, I think uh, <laughs> if, if, if we could have some, maybe here, so police services will bring this to our, their agenda, which is, agenda. is on the agenda already. Um, I think the, uh, um, and not, I'm not putting timelines on this at all, but I think uh, Dufferin Board of Trade sort of needs to he hear from the police uh, services and or from uh, detachment commanders um, whether it's whether it's uh, they're interested so they can start their business plan um, to prepare for the year right so because they still have the offsetting cost and I know it's less than the uh, uh, the 8,000 for the utilities is still less than the uh, what they would have normally paid of the 13,000 so there so there is there is still some cost there that they would like to set up I'm sure in share structure so um, if we could hear back from the police services and or OPP sooner than later, then it, uh, I'd, I think staff would like some direction to uh, let the, uh, um, not saying how council goes on this, but let the Board of Trade know that, that, that uh, um, they've accepted the content of Mark's memo 
and uh, that they may proceed with a business hub um, and try to occupy their vacant uh, um, their vacant rooms um, moving forward. I, I, I can certainly uh, alert uh, the detachment commander to the possible uh, use of that space and, and, and get her thinking about the issue such that when we have our police service board meeting, uh, we'll have a clear indication of whether it's a go or not. Or would council like to see that come as a memo from the clerk that the, the space is available and copy police services? And it stays. We, it, we tr it's tracked through the uh, through this agenda, and uh, and then uh, let uh, detached uh, Commander Randall right uh, aware of uh, aware of uh, the availability, and it will be subject to their uh, your agenda at the next coming upcoming meeting. And I'll have a quick chat with uh, with uh, with Dbot uh, with respect to this. Yeah. Because it, it will just it's going to depend on whether or not accept the space because I thought originally there were some concerns as to security etc uh, etc et well there is there is a uh, westerly door into that building that could that uh, there could be a one wall separation mm -hmm. installed so then you're fine with that direction then unless Fred sees okay. any difference in it I think we're good no, nope, that's all we were looking for was direction, including on the budgeting side. Okay, and so now we're on to item four, the uh, corporate service delivery and efficiency study. Um, with Mr. Monroe's comments at the beginning of the public question period, is there anything further that uh, council members have on this? Yes. Because I, I'm always the, the slow one, just internal efficiency. So we would presumably share this consultant to look at our internal efficiencies. What, can you just, in plain English, tell me what that means? I mean, is, does it mean how we get a work order written and out to the public works people? Does it mean how, how we do, how less does the, or how the payroll is done? Or what, 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 what do we mean? It would definitely be a, uh be a review of the existing way that we're providing our services. They would definitely probably look at our um, our council gets in, gets flagged for this all the time. I can't think of the word right now. The way that we the way that we present ourselves to the public and try to keep our public. They would look at it how we how we resident notification processes um, inside of my capital plan. We talked about. Uh, I also talked about efficiencies on. Our operations department, where they were, you know, plowing roads and, and doing things efficiently as well. So, um, so those are those are items that are. I mean, already in this agenda, we've looked at the issue of when we took over sidewalks, we hired a contractor. To do it. Now you've said it's it's better that we do that internally in our staff service. Would this consultant be looking at questions like that? Would, would it? Should we continue to do something like that with our own staff? versus go back to a consultant. And that, that could be for a number of things. I just I just wanted to make sure I understand what I what these internal efficiencies that we're talking about. And, and maybe I partly do, but in the absence of me reading the county draft RFP, I think I could provide a lot more information if I had read that. I, I just uh, that's been done through Mark. Um, but yeah, those are those are items. It's, it would basically it would probably extend into recreation, into treasury, into taxes, and, and everything on how we, uh, on how we are compared to other municipalities who are maybe, maybe less efficient or more efficient, and those would be all items that would be looked at under this. Uh, okay, because I know this is grant funds. We affect, affect our taxes because we're using part of that grant to pay for this consultant. When when do we make this decision as to whether or not we're going to do this? Or all. The suggestion here is that the budget reflect this fifty thousand dollars. So when are we making the decision? So if Mark puts the fifty thousand in the budget and you approve the budget, you're basically giving the CAO permission to proceed with uh, with the efficiency grant, subject to the timing of the uh, of the county RFP.
at, should should we choose the same consultant? It would be after or in parallel to the county review. So that, that means that then county RFP determines what those consultants going to do. I, I'm kind of thinking maybe council should have at least some look at this RFP and make some decisions as to is this what we want? Is this what we're asking the consultant to do? And I mean, I guess we don't have to. We can just but in, in actual fact, aren't we being told we have to do this by the province? Yeah. So we don't really have much say whether we do it or not. We have to do it. And team and last question. I could help maybe with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would as, I would assume after our study is done, uh, they'll probably have suggestions. If you purchase this piece of equipment, or you buy this type of computer software, you will now become more efficient in performing this function. So at this point, we don't know what they're going to recommend, but that grant would be used, you know, to to implement whatever recommendation would come from. Them. Well, when we originally got the the funds, there was no strings attached. Um, and then as information started coming out, there's, maybe there's not strings attached, but there's tiny little hooks or suggestions what we should do. I think that over time it might get, we'll be, like like Mike said, what we're getting, we're getting pushed into this. And then the grant would be used, whatever it takes to implement the, the new recommendation. I was uh, I was part of the uh, the county's delegation to meet with the Minister of Municipal Affairs at AMO, and uh, it is very very apparent that uh, we don't have a choice. We must examine how we spend money and how we deliver services. Period. And he was delighted to hear that we were um, open to that and prepared to do it. Um, I would see that. One of the one of the issues I'm sure the county will be looking at through its process is uh, is uh, um, uh, coordinating uh, uh, purchases um, throughout the county, like bulk bulk purchases. Uh, some of that goes on now; some of it does not. But I'm sure there's ways of, of uh, enhancing that uh, service delivery in general. Whether certain services should be uh, delivered uh, through cooperatively with other local municipalities or potentially in cooperation with the county. Again, some of that goes on. Um, and I hope, as I said earlier, uh, some weeks ago, that this will identify uh, certain things that are immediately taken off the table because there is no saving. Notwithstanding what Queens Park thinks, there is no saving in certain uh, amalgamations of service delivery and indeed of municipalities themselves so I think this is going to identify opportunities but it's also going to identify things that uh, uh, we would be uh, foolish to pursue okay so you're all done Fred okay so now we'll move on to schedule a uh, Sharon would you like to start I'm good. you're good how about you, John? Uh, I'm good. You're good? Okay. And, oh, um, yeah. Sorry. The, uh, actually, uh, number nine, which is Gary Randall's report on the delivery of uh, provincial offenses uh, program in, in, uh, in Dufferin. And uh, I've spoken about this before, but uh, it's well worth a read. Um, it, uh, it is exhaustive in terms of uh, analyzing the benefits of, of um, and, and, and difficulties of, of doing this uh, fundamentally differently, but it does open up a lot of opportunities for us to maximize our, our revenue uh, and uh, efficiently deliver the service. So I commend this to everyone. And uh, each municipality is getting a copy and, is, and, and the county is really acting as a facilitator here because ultimately it's the decision of each local municipality how we uh, uh, deliver this program. And it's really interesting because some people who have uh, 
commented on this think that we are doing this for the province. We are. Uh, we are not collecting revenue for the province. We're collecting revenue for ourselves. Uh, so the, the, the more efficiently we can do that and hopefully uh, uh, realize some of the almost $3 million in uh, uncollected uh, provincial offences fines, uh, the sooner we get uh, on top of that, the better. I know I'm always asking for my hand to be held on this, but number seven, the Protect Mold people have made a very strong argument that in the revised uh, provincial policy statements, there's there's a, a real there's a danger, there's a red flag there, because once a license has been granted to an aggregate producer, they can apparently just amend that license and allow them to move below the water table. And now you, you know that me knowing that stuff is way over my head, David. But that's from my let me just finish before you come back. So I'm, I'm concerned about that, and in our comments, did we mention that province? But let me just continue on, because then I know down here that the, under number 11, TRCA has submitted comments on the provincial policy statement, right? But in, the, in what's attached here, I don't know what those comments are. Maybe they've already taken care of that point, in which case I would, I would feel somewhat at ease. So my question really is to do with any items in Schedule A that have to do with the provincial policy statement, and where are we? We did submit comments, right? To your question, Councillor Nix, yes, we did. Um, those comments went out actually um, yesterday. That was the deadline, well in time, but the deadline was actually midnight. They went out yesterday early afternoon. They included uh, a very clear uh, point that Council, Town of Moore Council, strongly is opposed to any change in the provincial policy statement that would allow for uh, below water table extraction. Uh, and I did reference the, the, the additional proposed provision under the, uh, the basket of new policies that are being proposed. There's actually 2524, just so you know. The comments that were submitted by TRCA, I mean, uh, they have their own independent policy division and they did weigh in with comments to the PPS review. Uh, it was put in a chart form, so it was very readable. And I believe they also alluded to that. The other thing they did allude to actually uh, was uh, a provision respecting aggregate extractions adjacent to or with the natural heritage features subject that there not be any negative impacts. And basically what the TRCA said was, pits are in there for the long term. You know, they're generally at least, at least a decade, if not multiple decades. And they basically said this proposed policy is, um, it's not achievable. So they were fairly clear back to the province that if you are gonna allow extractions next to or adjacent to natural heritage features, there's got, it has to be reasonable. You can't say providing there's no negative impact when in fact much of the time, if not most of the time, there in fact would be. And uh, they, they itemize a number of other things with respect to natural heritage, feature impacts, and so on and so forth, as well as all the other policies that are being proposed in the PPS review. So it was put through Yeah, it was. There, there, just to your point though, um, the council resolution from October 8th did say also providing comments to the ARA review. That's a separate uh, Ontario registry number. <clears throat> and uh, I have another, I prepare another draft to deal with separate but aligned comments to the uh, aggregate review act. Uh, the deadline's November 4th, so it'll be before that actually. back and try to finish reading that report. <laughs> Sorry. To that point, it just, you know, there, it's a comprehensive trail plan. I think from Mono, from what I can see of the mapping, it, 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 it really is capturing the Bruce Trail component. Yeah. Well, I'll just carry on from Fred's introduction there on the trail. <laughs> it's a big document and I just scanned it, but a number of things really stood out. And one was that they, um, 
presently they say they have 520 um, kilometers of trails and they're going to expand it to a thousand. It's a pretty ambitious thing. It extends from um, uh, the Rouge River on the east uh, to the uh, Oak Ridges Marine and, and, and up here to the, to the Tomono. Um, so it's interesting. It's hard to digest it. Having worked on our own trail committee um, and understand, understanding some of the issues and problems, uh, one is where do you put the trail? And so they are using established trails. They're using major um, uh, power and utility corridors, and they're using uh, major roads. So it's not quite clear on that because they show a, a trail going along air, beside Airport Road, and and furthermore they show one going along Highway 407. <laughs> this is a, not a not a relaxed place to walk. Anyway, I'm I'm being a bit facetious, but what really stood out to me was the numbers that they had for for biking, and they say that you know all of for your Toronto that there are 182,000 182,000 people that bike uh, in Toronto daily. And that um, uh, there are 163,000 that actually commute to work um, either by walking or by, by biking. So, in Toronto's recognizing this, I think they're doing quite a bit with respect to their, their uh, trail system. Second thing I'd like to comment is on the um, uh, uh, Board of Health report. Uh, they're getting quite fussed about paving. And um, the issues are two. Uh, one is that there are uh, significant respiratory illnesses which are hospitalizing people. I think the latest number was about 800 in the United States and 12 uh, apparently died of related to these. And they, they, when you read a little bit of the stories of some of these people, they've been vaping for two or three years and they it's gradually starting to give it more short of breath and more of a cough and, and suddenly something happens and nobody quite knows what it is. They, I asked at the last board meeting if they knew what the agent was which had given the problem, like it was suggested that it was maybe emulsified fat, which uh, some of these uh, substances like THC is an oil. Uh, and nobody seems to quite know. So, so anyway, that's that's a concern. The second problem is that most of these, maybe all of the substances contain nicotine, and the dosage of nicotine is sometimes far, far higher than it is in cigarettes. So the issue becomes one of addiction. So vaping was put out as a possible way for people to um, break the, ha the cigarette habit. So if you have a cigarette habit, you're going to probably uh, you increase your chance of lung cancer and COPD. So we vape and we don't have that problem, but we now we have two additional problems, another type of respiratory problem, and we still have the addiction thing. And so the last figures for the Wellington Dufferin um, Wealth Board of Health assessment of teenagers in schools that were smoking showed there was an upswing and that more people were more kids were smoking now cigarettes than they had before and they relate this to the fact that they need the nicotine and if they don't get it from the vaping they go to a cigarette. Okay. So if there's nothing further, uh, we have a motion that we accept Schedule A to this agenda. Can I have a mover? John? One seconded by Magdalene. All in favor? Carries? Okay, so now we're on to reports from staff and council. Uh, so, Les. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, as council is aware, we have the new phone system uh, working. Uh, like anything new, we're getting get, getting to learn it. So there might be a couple of hiccups along the way, but uh, when it's all said and done, uh, should should prove to be pretty, pretty amazing compared to the old one. And of course. <clears throat> It's budget time, November 12th is the council. Uh, the budget presentation to council, you have the agenda or the budget with the agenda that goes out the week before. And at staff level, uh, this week I'm meeting with each of the department heads to hopefully fine tune it before it gets to council. Okay. A heads up on the budget. In the past, we, you know what happens. We, we come in with the draft budget and we tend to try to Wheel it down until we're hitting the same CPI that we use for the wage increase. Do you have any inkling this year whether that's going to be possible? I have some concerns because of a lot of things seem to be ganging up on us, but do you have a sense of where we will be on the budget? Um, the last couple of years I've warned council that uh, the, the growth uh, assessment part of our budget that we do get additional tax revenues will come to an end. Well, it's, it's come to an end for 2020. Uh, it's very limited. So we won't have that source of 
tax revenue. I mean, obviously, with new subdivision, there's also additional costs because Mike is reporting he needs additional pieces of equipment so that gets paid through development charges. But there's still all the maintenance costs and additional staffing required. Uh, it's going to be tough. Uh, the, uh, the big thing this year, as we saw in Mike's budget, is the bridge 39 to 1.1 million, which was which wasn't on our radar until just a couple of years ago. Now we have to deal with it. So. It's gonna, it's gonna, like last year was tough. This year is gonna be tough 2.0. <laughs> well, I mean, we're gonna be sitting down and discussing, and um, hopefully we'll have some suggestions for council about uh, how to meet your objective of, of the two percent. So, yeah, I mean, even before it gets to, to, to council, there's, there's a lot of background work done at the staff level, and we have some ideas, and then at budget time, council just has to. Okay, there's only so many capital projects we can do this year, even though they're on the list. Uh, we, will, we will have a recommendation, what does have to go ahead, and then it's council's decision, you know, projects that can wait, which ones you want to wait with, and which ones you still want to go with. Kim. Uh, I guess uh, to report, as you know, um, less and you all know it's budget time so pretty busy in that respect um, also busy with uh, finishing up some capital projects within uh, um, the rec department um, the Halloween party is this Sunday 3 to 5 at the Model Community Centre we have um, 136 people registered at this point um, expecting between 2 and 250 um, to attend. Uh, we also have the 3 R's Christmas Bazaar coming up, a new program um, on November 16th with Reduce, Reuse and Recycle Your Christmas Decorations. Um, we have 15 vendors registered for it at this point, so that's going to be a go. Looking forward to it. Uh, last week I attended um, a webinar or sat in on a webinar on accessibility in the built environment um, which was put on um, by one of our ministries I can't remember which one right now but I found it very informative um, they spoke about parks and trails and um, some of the things that champions in London Vaughan and Sarnia have done in their communities in order to um, be more accessible. Um, so I'll be bringing a few points of that forward to council as, as we move on with different topics. And uh, tomorrow I'm heading to, tomorrow, Thursday, I'm heading to a strategic planning um, workshop by DC Moves um, that they're putting on at Georgian College. So lots going on. Um, and uh, yeah, just working away on, on budget to get it prepared for you. Mayor Ryan. Um, well, yes, in terms of budget, uh, you know, planning doesn't have tangible assets, so I have a draft operational budget which really focuses on revenue and um, our operational expense outline that I'll go over with uh, less in the coming days. Um, other than that, um, not too much to report. Really ongoing work with Dufferin County in terms of the uh, alignment for the official plan update. There's a steering committee now in place, or they want to put in place for the municipal comprehensive review, the update, and uh, they've asked local tier planners to be involved, so I will be. Um, that's about it. We are looking at the zoning bylaw update shortly in terms of an RFP, uh, and I'll be dealing with Mark on that. Um, and it's going to focus on a number of things, including deficiencies in. Um, not just operational and uh, procedural matters, but also a lot of housekeeping matters and alignment of definitions and, and various policy uh, areas throughout all of the sections. So that will really get some guidance too by what's happening at the upper tier level with the official plan review. So we'll have that benefit actually in terms of a concurrent arrangement. Um, other than that, I think that's about a goal for now. Um, that's it. Um, just we received no formal reports with respect to all the leaf viewing that was going on but our parking lots were definitely 
bursting at the seams, so it was good to see that people enjoyed uh, enjoyed Mono. Um, fifth line south of 25, we're looking at probably opening that road in the next couple of days, so we've uh, we still got some guide rail to put in there, but we definitely, uh, um, it's turned out pretty good and natural looking, I would say, as natural as an armor stone retaining wall can look, but uh, it definitely, uh, definitely better than the sheet piling. Um, budgets, brushing, the roadside brushing will commence uh, probably 1st of November after the leaves are gone, so I'm um, hoping to get half the uh, half the town completed this year, and that's uh, pretty well where we are on that. We're continuing to ditch, trying to get still got fl block culverts and so forth. Road grading, you're going to start to see in-depth grading. Um, I don't know if council noticed a change, but we did a lot of spot grading this year, and there wasn't a lot of uh, full road. We didn't open the roads uh, as much as what we had done in the previous years, so. Um, you will start to see in-depth grading though because we need to get that stone on the top of the gravel before freeze up that's the uh, that's the ultimate goal is to get that stone exposed um, winter staff the uh, the majority of them will be started in in-house on November 15th um, you may start to see some dry run snow plowing and uh, we have a couple uh, operators that didn't haven't worked here in the past so you will see some snow plows uh, starting to drive around with the blade up uh, and those would be dry runs. We're looking for hazards and we're trying to get everybody formalized with the routes again and get the feel of it and the same will go for our uh, sidewalk snow machine that's in-house already. Um, you'll start to see uh, you'll start to see those pieces of equipment uh, running probably when there's no snow so in the training and so forth. So other than that uh, we're good. Couple of points. First, first of all, thank you, Mike, and the town for taking care of that. Several dead ash trees, but one of which was off the road allowance on right side of Mayhew's trail that they couldn't handle. I appreciate that. I, I assume that Lily is tree service that went back and did that ash tree. Also, thanks for the load of gravel that you put on the parking lot of the Bruce Trail property on Fifth Line. We were very appreciative of that. E even though that gravel was on your road allowance, it had to be well, I hope we only did the apron. I haven't gone to look, but thank uh, you for that. Now I think we, I think we would have done the apron. That's a typical level of service that we pr would provide to residents. I, uh, I just know they were happy. It was a long discussion between those but no, applications, I, but yes. I have a question for you. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the town line, Hammer Mono town line at the north end, is part of their uh, truck route bylaw system. There's no trucks allowed going southbound. That's on the Amherst side. Of the there's signs up that say no. Emirates has some truck signs, no truck signs so posted on many of their roads. Well, my question is, so trucks aren't allowed to go southbound on the town line, but we have no signs on our side of the road saying they're, whether or not they're allowed to go northbound. I believe they have some tonnage issues on the two structures north of 20. Yeah, north of 20 now. The town of Mono has replaced uh, two of our structures along our section, so there's no no load issues. But it's not, it's not part of our truck route bylaw. We don't have a no truck route bylaw. The only no trucks, the only no truck section we have, the only formal no truck bylaw we have is French Drive. And then we have. Uh, My question was, is shouldn't we coordinate with Amherst as to what routes are or are not part of our truck route bylaw system? Um, I could definitely inquire as to what the extent of their signage is. I, I do know they don't have a posted fine on them um, as well, or a bylaw number, so. It's a small point, but mm -hmm. it's true. So far, it's only been up to the last month, so. Uh, so with respect to the designation of the globe, we have to put uh, an advertisement in the newspaper, which has to be out for a minimum of 30 days. So the soonest I can get that in is not this Thursday, but next Thursday. So 30 days from that means it won't be able to come back if there are no objections. The bylaw designating the globe cannot come back before the December 10th council meeting. And if there is an objection, 
Uh, I gave everyone a copy of a proposed 2020 council meeting schedule that is proposed and there are some notes. The reason I'm going through that is to note specifically the uh, LPAT hearing in Greenwood, which runs for uh, six weeks starting August 24th, and that'll have some impact on, uh, on council meetings because those are scheduled to occur here, the hearing. Um, we've, we've spoken, you know, between myself, planning and, and our and legal about how we're going to accommodate council meetings, but we haven't sorted any details out on that. So that's just a heads up on that. Uh, we have received so far three applications for the electoral reform task force and I'd like some idea of how long we want to keep that open for applications until I bring those back to council. And you know, keep in mind obviously we've got a, a three weeks until the next council meeting and I only need four or five days to prepare for that. So it it ran until the 1st of November. So that's. Do we have to. So. Yeah, it can easily run to the 1st of November uh, before we have to close it off. Um, and if we want to. Or if we want to establish some other criteria, such as a number of applications, or um, do we want to set a date to close it off, regardless of how many we receive? Brad, are, oh, sorry. Are, are you talking about keeping keeping the um, the website uh, process open, or are you looking at placing another ad in the newspaper? Uh, well, I, I'll take direction on that. Uh, at this point, because we've placed the ads and uh, we'll run them for two weeks, um, we'll keep promoting it through our other channels unless council directs to put another. I, just speaking personally, I think one ad in the, in the newspaper is enough that we keep it alive on the, on the website. That's my personal opinion. So that's the direction from council, and then we'll keep it open to close it sometime uh, to be able to process it for the next council meeting? Okay. That's easy enough. Of course, tomorrow is a uh, emergency management exercise countywide. Uh, the mayor, deputy mayor, and a number of people from staff, uh, the director of public works will be sitting in for the CAO as uh, the alternate uh, senior municipal official, uh, as well as myself and uh, Matt Donut. Um, we'll all be uh, participating in that. Uh, if you'd like, I have hard copies of the documents that were sent out if you want to pick them up now. We've, uh, we meaning Mark specifically, has uh, been in touch with uh, uh, Nicole Randall about uh, a memorandum of understanding uh, over uh, the police servicing and the bylaws. So that's in the process. It's in her hands right now to see if she has any samples um, that she might be able to provide as a starting point on drafting that. Haven't heard back from her yet. And uh, also the same when it comes to uh, the OPP contract. Uh, we have informed Linda Davis of the OPP that the town is uh, looking to uh, secure a four-year contract. Um, we're working on the plastics bylaw. I don't think it'll come back uh, at the next meeting because I'm sure Mark's going to want to <coughs> sit down with that before it comes uh, to council. But a draft will be ready for him when he gets back. And finally, on the uh, community, uh, the property standards and pulling the uh, community uh, guidelines out of that, I attended a uh, seminar last Friday specifically on property standards where they were wholeheartedly in favor of pulling everything out of a standards property bylaw that's not building code related and getting that out of property standards so exactly what we're looking at doing. Um, they couldn't provide any suggestions, though, on how to address the differing standards between rural and, uh, and urban and whether we bifurcate that based on 
lot size, zoning, or scheduling specific geographic areas. There is no recommendations that we're able to convey in that, unfortunately. So staff is still struggling on how to, uh, how to approach it. Yes. Uh, just a couple of things. I know we're putting you to work on the plastics bylaw, and I apologize, but Ralph apologizes for that. But I did hear again <laughs> that the Liberals, again, are talking about a nationwide plastic ban for 2021. But how, how do you know how serious they are? Is that, is that was that just a lecture talk? But I heard it again. I was listening to some verbal speeches. The second thing, a question for you, Fred, but also for the rest of council. Four or five months ago, there was a request from the county. It might have been this new economic development officer, or maybe maybe not. They were going to do some study of the food industry in the county, and they wanted either staff or councillors from each municipality to help them out with some questions. So I kind of reluctantly put up my hand. Do you, do you remember that, Fred? And, and I, I got one email back from this county staff member or consultant sort of saying that he or she would be away for two weeks and then get back to me. That's it. I've never heard anything more on that study of the food industry. I'll follow up on that. Uh, I haven't heard anything either, uh, Fred, on it. I thought you had been contacted in your getting ready to do those interviews, but I'll follow up with the county. Well, not that I'm mad at you, but I, I guess probably, you know, it just hasn't heard back. Mm -hmm. So, Ralph. Uh, we'll give a formal report on the pollinator garden probably in the new year, but just a couple of things to mention. It's been a good year for education. Uh, we've had a, a couple of children's uh, classes. Uh, uh, this year we tried a younger grades group, to, uh, eight, uh, grade two and three this fall, and I think it was very successful. And um, yeah, as you know, we were part of the farm tour, uh, having a booth that was very well visited. Uh, we've had three, um, three uh, different things that have happened in the pollinator garden this year that are worth mentioning. One is that we have a, a small plot, which is um, uh, a wildflower meadow type plot. You know, previously our, our we have groups of flowers that are planted more of a traditional garden type. So this is a this is an, uh, an area we'd like to move into probably for the south plot. The south plot's a problem because it's had a infestation with canada thistle. I mean, major. And so we've, um, with um, uh, advice from the local farmer, uh, James Richards, we've um, put in a competitive crop of millet and sorghum. And this is supposed to outgrow the, the uh, Canada thistle. And promptly we put that in, it stopped raining for six weeks. <laughs> so it did not grow at its potential. And then I think it's been of some value and we'll probably do it again. We want to get rid of it as much as we can before we replot. The third plot is interesting. It's a soil health plot. Try and make the soil healthier. We have a couple of areas there which things do not grow very well. It's the old we brought in some new, new soil. We brought in topsoil, and uh, the, the, those plots are amazing. These are the mountains. So there's a couple of plant flat areas. So we've taken a, a page out of uh, the soil regenerative um, concepts of farming, and we're trying to create a, a healthier soil. Basically, a healthier soil means getting more um, organic material within the soil. And uh, so that's a small project there, and various things are happening. We're plant planting, our fall planting was done with a so-called green manure, and we've also brought in uh, uh, castings, um, worm castings, and, and manure, and uh, that's a civil project, which is interesting. And um, that's, that's all of it. Um, I, I guess this isn't town business, but did you, did you have a picture, Fred? Um, I spent the, every year the Calvin Hills Bruce Trail Club does its annual end to end hike and uh, Frank and I for oh gosh going on 25 years have done the checkpoint on Hockley Road. Now the county made that section of Hockley Road a no parking zone and you can see my car uh, behind Frank at there. So I, to do that I, I get an occupancy permit from the county post a five million dollar insurance um, one time liability thing, which is no problem, but every once in a while, every few years, the OPP stops to find out why I'm parked there, and I show them my occupancy permit. Now that, that chap, I forget his last name, his first name is Kyle, 
and he's tall. And <laughs> oh, really? I yeah. the other way around. <laughs> well, all right, all right, I'm not that tall. But he stopped, and, and uh, he, he was quite impressed with what we were doing. He told him about the hikers. We had close to 100 hikers go through there. Uh, he, he, at last count, had three pieces of rice and kidney bread. So he, he, <laughs> seems, he seems to think I'm a, I'm, I'm a good cook. So that, that's what I did on the, on the Labor Day weekend. Um, other than that, uh, I, I don't have anything to report. Uh, that I can think of. <coughs> that's Peter Uni with the Orange Bill Road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know Peter? Mm -hmm. And then there's Frank, and then the others are hunt, are hunting. We had Rosemont Fire Board yesterday, and so the proposed budget is being circulated. Uh, we're looking at 2.9. Yeah, this is less like than 3% increase. And uh, it's interesting that uh, we now are going under the new um, division of, of uh, levy system, and the capital is levied at the same percentage. So what the argument in terms of the agreement between the municipalities that you're having in Shelburne, we have resolved it. So there is there is hope. <laughs> and uh, so I think, you know, things are, are I think, reasonably listed. And uh, we've done a lot of uh, work with our new treasurer, secretary treasurer, and she's provided us with information on investments and audits and et cetera, et cetera. So it's working out well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. The new people at the table and that way, so. Um, and other than that, uh, can't think of anything else. Uh, it's not as much going on now that uh, tourism is no longer on the plate. <laughs> John, did you have anything? Yes, uh, two things. Um, I hope to have a second draft of the uh, Community Safety Task Force report out to my colleagues. Uh, and I'm shooting for uh, bringing it to council on the 12th of November. Uh, I think that should be sufficient time for uh, everyone to have at it in terms of draft number two. Uh, there will be some changes. I've received comments back from Fred and, uh, and, and a few other members of the task force and we're checking some numbers now um, but uh, I think we will be able to at least present it on, on the 12th maybe not discuss it in any great detail but it will be in your hands mm -hmm. having edited uh, John's first draft and okay if you're going to come back for the next draft on November 12th that's the same, same day Wes will be presenting the draft budget so I, without, I realize that any time during our OPP contract, we can ask for a, a, a extra service, but unless the number's in the budget there to pay for that, for the, what do you call enhanced level of service, mm -hmm. I, I think we should make plans, knowing what your recommendations are in your first draft, that there, there should be a number less for next year. And I'm not sure, because uh, I mean, if I, if I te tell less now what I think the number is, I'm giving away the, your recommendation. But, but I do think that number should be in your draft budget. Otherwise, our, our hands are strapped in 2020, okay? We don't want that. Maybe I could I could uh, communicate with Les and, and give you um, uh, scenario A, scenario B, um, and uh, we'll confirm that with, uh, with, uh, the, um, with uh, Nikki uh, Randall as well in terms of, of the most accurate information. Uh, so that that's what I'm uh, that's what my target is and the second thing is uh, This is the uh, anniversary of the uh, municipal election today If memory serves me right October 22nd I believe it was October 22nd So congratulations to everyone and I've had a, an absolute blast Sharon uh, First of all, this is uh, Library Week, and uh, we had the kickoff for Library Week at the Shelburne Library, and uh, Sylvia Jones was there and made some very nice comments about um, 
libraries in general and and uh, Shelburne in particular, of course. And uh, it, it it was really it. To be perfectly honest, it wasn't that well attended. But I did invite you all, and uh, but it was a very. Uh, they had. Caledon had a table there and showed us some interesting things, uh, and so was Grand Valley, uh, Shelburne, and Orangeville had a, a table as well with uh, sh showing different things that they're doing in their libraries, which are quite remarkable. This isn't your old-fashioned library by any means. They are great places to, to be, and it covers a toddler to whatever age. Uh, there are all kinds of programs there. So uh, maybe you could have a look into that. Also, one of my favorite things about the pollinator garden is that we are working on the soil. It's been in my head for quite a while and and uh, better soil. And we can probably end up with a report on this to give other people hope when they have land that is not working out well for them things aren't coming up the way they want them to. Um, also on Saturday, um, the uh, MC Squared is doing their, is having their, the plastic, it's um, at event and the two, both speakers are quite renowned and well known. And it's at the, it's at the New Hope Church. Uh, isn't that what it's called? Yeah. On, uh, yeah out on uh, Riddell Road, yeah. So if anybody's interested in that, that's 9 a.m. And it will be well attended and it will be highly interesting, particularly since that's one of the areas we are talking about here in Mono. Yeah. Okay, uh, notices on motion. Ralph, you said you had one? Did you put your mic on? So um, this is all about water, and it's something that we've talked about in the past, and there's been some interest in it, and it sort of got set to one side. I've talked to Mark, and I've talked to um, um, Mike about this to uh, get their perspective, and um, so we're going ahead with the notice to motion. It is, uh, whereas our town is recognized and identified as the headwaters, whereas our rivers and streams are the jewels of our environment, Whereas there are 37 bridges crossing rivers and streams on the town, on the town roads, and none of the waterways have signage. Whereas the knowledge of the correct name of a river or stream is an important step in raising awareness, creating respect for, and protecting our waterways. Whereas knowing the name of a waterway aids geographic connectivity and encourages commitment to preservation of the places where we all work and live. Therefore, be it resolved that Council directs staff to prepare and install, install signage that identifies the names of the towns, rivers, and creeks, that this signage be placed at appropriate bridge and culvert sites throughout the town. And further, given that there is a controversy about the correctness of some of the names, that a committee of knowledgeable people be formed to critically examine and advise on the correctness of the names. And further, that the members of this committee be selected and overseen by the Director of Public Works. And further, that the Town of Mono use grant funding or make this a budget item for 2020. I recognize that's just a notice of motion, but can I put some important information on the floor? No, I'd be very pleased to modify this as it, okay. it was within 25 budget. or 30 years ago, there was a committee, Scott. Um, none of you people were here, so you don't remember this, but okay. Mark did. Um, to sit and do exactly name the, the streams and creeks. I believe, I hope I'm right, I still have a map that came out of that uh, exercise. I think Bob Shirley was on it. It was 25 or it probably, probably a year ago. Yeah. If it doesn't ring a bell, it doesn't. I wouldn't be surprised. I, I know it because of the anomaly of Matthews Creek and, or Matthews Creek subdivision and the creek. Now, I'm going on memory. I know the creek is called McMaster. And the subdivision is called Master, or vice versa. <laughs> and I think someone got messed up at that time in terms of what the correct name of that creek is. 
That'd be great because we um, thought Mark and Mike thought that there was a file in the, uh, shall we say, in the dungeon, and we couldn't find it with the map that mapping on. So that that would be great. Um, we, uh, I think, I think we can start it without that if we uh, need to. But um, and I've, I've also costed it with Mike, and it's too much. So we. I guess we, we can't do anything with the, um, the development of the, the draft budget for discussion for the next meeting, the 12th. However, when your motion comes back at that time, if it passes, then you could uh, offer the opportunity to have it included. In, okay? Okay. And, and I'm, I was wondering if the, um, the grant that uh, we were going to make use of for the trails was also applicable to this situation. Okay, then. So if there's nothing further, uh, we will close off. That we introduce and give the necessary readings to a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Council of the Town of Mola in Session 20-2019, held on the 22nd of October 2019, that it be signed by the Mayor and the Clerk and sealed and grossed in the bylaw book. Moved by Martin and seconded by Creelman. All in favor? Carries. And we adjourn at 12.10 p.m. And so that's moved by Max Mullins, seconded by Nix. All in favor? Yeah. I think it's just a matter. Of, it's just a matter of crazy glue. <laughs>